What's up, everybody? It's the Mike O'Geeky Podcast, the podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at-home mycology game. I'm your host, Mike O'Geeky. We're going to do a quick little disclaimer. I started this last week. Um, if you really want to read it all, um, you can pause this after we're done going live here. Basically, it just says... We're here to entertain you guys. If you guys decide to try anything on here, uh, it's because you made that decision your own free will. Nobody twisted your arm. Nobody gave you any any advice. Um, all that good stuff. So, anyway, legalese aside, tonight here we go. We're we're gonna do it, guys. I got my trusty. Where is it here? Man, it's gonna take me a while. I got my favorite lab uh, necessary art sculpture back there, courtesy of my boy Royce. Um, what was that? I was pouring some agar there uh, earlier, doing some transfers, getting some work done, as uh, you guys uh, all know we all do. Um, but nobody works harder than my guest tonight. Well, maybe a few people do, but this guy works pretty hard. Um, he... Uh, he, 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 he's, he's a cool dude. He uh, does a lot for the community. Um, he is a, a, a monster vendor and definitely keeps, uh, keeps people growing, which is what it's all about. So we're, that, that's, uh, I'm talking about Nicky Maiko, guys, in case you didn't know. Uh, so we're going to bring him on in a minute, but first I'm going to talk to my buddy Kyle Kanan. Uh, Kyle is an Ohio boy like myself. Uh, he's a little bit more south than I am. And uh, he's got a little uh, nonprofit that he got going um, to kind of help. Uh, anyway, you know what? I'm going to let him him tell you what, what's going on here. Let me pull him on. What's up, dude? Hey, how's it going? It's good. So, Kyle, tell me about this. Uh, let me, let me, I'm going to pull up the screenshot real quick. There it is. Love Our Land, Ohio Mushroom DNA Sequencing Initiative. That's right. T tell me about it. Cool. So, yes, I'm part of the nonprofit Love Our Land. Um, we started in southwest uh, Ohio, uh, but we have plans to, you know, expand across the state. And um, we are a we're a community conservation group. So we are focusing on just uh, connecting people to the land in all different types of ways. We have different specialists and um things that we do but one of the things we are taking on is this mushroom dna sequencing initiative that i'm leading and i've started um so right now we're equipped with um all the equipment to run sanger sequencing um which is great but the the cost um you know tends to add up with the la that lab fee so we are fundraising money and we are attempting to purchase the new nanopore technology so that way it brings down um, that cost of sequencing and then cuts out that middleman, um, i.e. that lab. So it's kind of what we're doing. Um, cool. So, yeah, I, uh, uh, for those of you uh, just tuning in, um, I happened to catch uh, a post from Kyle today that was like, hey, guys, I, I'm looking to do a push uh, on my GoFundMe. Um, really want to get this uh, going because this initiative is going to just take off by leaps and bounds. Uh, once he gets this uh, nanopore uh, minion sequencer going, it's going to allow him to not have to outsource aspects of the sequencing process. And uh, he's going to go from doing small batch sequencing to doing much like huge batch sequencing. And uh, so when I saw this, I said, you know, dude, let's get you on the podcast mm -hmm. for a couple minutes tonight. Let's tell everybody what's going on. And, uh, you know, if, if you got a couple bucks to spare, um, just go to the GoFundMe. I got it linked in the description below, and uh, that will help Kyle um, do some mushroom shit, which is what I'm all about. So, uh, cool. yeah, man, uh, I, I hope this goes well. Uh, I hope you get all this gear ready to go by spring, because come spring... That's the collection is on that that's when that's when it's go time so, <laughs> that's yeah. it yeah cool and then just if you could just mention the website and people could learn more about it if they went to our loverland.org and then clicked on the mushroom page and kind of explains more in detail the the initiative and how we're going to go with it that's and awesome. how people could get involved so appreciate so the time lo loveourland.org correct O-R-G. cool yep. easy enough 
Yep. All right. Well, that's great. I think it's awesome you're doing this stuff. I've seen uh, a lot of the ways you're uh, a part of this organization, and I, I really respect it. So uh, Thank thanks you. for coming on. And yep, uh, for, for those you. of you guys uh, who do like uh, DNA sequencing and are interested in that, I'm going to have Kyle and a few other uh, – DNA sequencers on, and we're going to talk sequencing here shortly. It's coming up in, in a month or so, so uh, Ooh, stay cool. tuned. I'm excited. Yep. Yep. All right. All right. Th thanks, thanks for having me on. Thanks again, man. Yep. Thanks for all you. All right, guys. So that was Kyle. Um, loveourland.org, um, and the, the link to the GoFundMe is in the description below. So uh, if you guys are so inclined, uh, I'm sure he would appreciate that. And uh, he does a lot of work for, for Love Our Land, so... Um, if, if you want to love Kyle and, and let him love the land, that's, you know, a, a, a buck, two bucks, five bucks, ten bucks, whatever you want to do. I know he also, he's got like uh, some, some, some gear. If you go check him out on Facebook, uh, you know, if you donate at a certain level, he'll, he'll send you a bunch of goodies so we can do that too. Anyway, so without further ado, the one, the only, if you're on Facebook and you grow cubes and you don't know this guy, then I don't believe you. You're not on Facebook. The one and only, Nicky Maiko. What's up, dude? Hey, what's up, man? Hey, uh, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, hopefully, I'm really happy to be here. Um, okay, we got good audio. The, that video started out shaky, but that's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll get it reined in. The, the internet's just not ready for you, dude. It's just trying to catch up. <laughs> um, Our internet's been funky all day. Yeah, so so uh, for those of you guys watching, uh, I had a spectrum outage earlier today, and I'm sitting there going, well, I sure hope this uh, outage does not last too much longer. And then sh it, sure enough, it was just a few hours. Uh, but Nikki was texting me going, yeah, um, we're still out. We don't have internet yet. So who knows? Maybe <laughs> the internet's getting itself figured out still. Uh, well, but, but it's all good. Audio sounds good. So, um, so Facebook... That, that's where I was first introduced to you, and um, like I was saying, you you like you and Dave particularly, you guys just have a real presence on a lot of groups. You got your own groups. You guys uh, do a lot for the community, um, and you have a monster library. Like I always tell people. Uh, they go, uh, ju I just had a guy, I was like, oh, I need, I, you know, I need this, this cultigen. And I was like, well, did you ask Nikki? No. <laughs> well, then, okay, why don't you do that first? And, and, and then we'll, we'll see. So um, the title of, of the podcast was uh, Triple Threat Cultivator. Um, and I, I'm curious, what did you cultivate first? Um, so what was the first to cultivate? The first thing I ever cultivated at all was uh, mushrooms. Okay, that was. I like yeah, that it was answer. mushrooms uh, about three years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we do this every time. Uh, g give me your mushroom, your like Myco origin story. What, how did you find yourself in this world? So a lot of people know that, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and ditch the mask. I don't like talking with it. So uh, a lot of people know that uh, I'm a recovered addict. And so uh, I spent the most of my adult life as a heroin addict. And after getting sober, I moved to the coastline and I had full custody of my kiddo. And I ended up uh, dating Susie. Mm -hmm. And at one point we were just at Susie's house and we were talking and she mentioned that there was magic mushrooms growing in her backyard right now. And I was like, what? I was like, no freaking way. I, I had done magic mushrooms before, but it had always been when I was like really young, like a teenager. Right. And so it had been quite a while. And I just was really astonished that they were just growing there. I remember hearing kids go up to the coastline always, but uh, I had never uh, gone up and picked my own before. And so I was like, show me. And we went outside and her, she had a, a bark chip like that sided the, the, the entire property of her fence. Okay. And uh, they were, they were everywhere. And I was like, this is insane. I was like, this is a lot of mushrooms. And she was like, yeah, yeah, I know. She was like, I've been needing to get out here and get to them. And uh, I just thought it was really crazy. I thought it was really crazy that they were growing in her yard. And then I asked her if she had put them there. And she said, oh, no, they just grow in most awesome. yards and in most businesses yards out here. Uh, the Oregon coast is just really blessed. And um, after uh, after basically plucking out everything I could out of her yard. I started walking around the neighborhood 
And it just kind of like skyrocketed from there. I was out every single day, any second I wasn't at work or I wasn't at home with my kid. I was on my bike scouting out new spots all around town looking for, for uh, cyans. And after season ended, like I just felt super empty and I basically was just like, Oh man, like I, I, I got to do something mushroom related still. That's what I spent all my time doing was foraging for the last two months. Right. And we just kind of dove in. Dude. I love that's, that might be my favorite Micah origin story to date <laughs> that. I mean, cause there's a, I mean, there is a bit of the addict in there, right? Like you, you got, addicted Oh yeah. To this has been replaced. Yeah, absolutely. No, hundred percent. We can all before, relate, dude. We can all relate. We're all <laughs> addicted to this hobby in one way or another. Um, before I was doing this hobby, I was riding. I, I was like 150 pounds, and I was riding mm-hmm. my bike like 10 miles a day. And uh, I like it probably wasn't even the healthiest trade off in the world, sitting in front of a flowhead all day instead of riding right. my bike. But right. uh, this year, I'm picking the bike back up. Nice. That's the whole thing. This year, I'm gonna pick the bag back up. I'm gonna find a balance or something like that because. Mm-hmm. Three years of just mycology, and I look a lot different. <laughs> well, well, the dream is one day, once full decriminalization or, or therapeutic legalization, you could start a mushroom delivery service, like a bike <laughs> courier service, and then you could kill two birds with one stone. That would be great. There you go. Yeah, that would be interesting. Hell, I would do that. Um, oh, so, okay, that's great. I love that story. So that was first. Um, and, and then when, when did the cannabis and the cacti come into play? So cactus about two years ago, I bought a couple succulents online Mm -hmm. and anytime I, I, I've always been the kind of guy that like, anytime I buy something, I always ask like, just out of curiosity, where's the price break? Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I think I, (laughs) I think they told me, oh, if you buy 10 of these, I'll cut the cost in half. And I was like, oh, like I already kind of was selling spores. And so I was like, right. my friends, most of my friends are kind of into it. plants and herbs and cactus and anything that they can grow right. at all. And so, uh, you know, very, very plant based community. And so I was like, I'll go ahead, I'll buy some. And then I, and then I guarantee I can find some friends that will throw in on it and we'll all go ahead and get really cheap cactus. Right. And uh, it, it, yeah, that's exactly how it went. And it escalated until like one time I had a cactus order that was really, really large. And that's when I basically like made the decision, okay, I'm going to go ahead and and try posting in a cactus group and seeing how selling cactus goes. And that went really well because there wasn't a whole ton of people that already were super reputable. And there was a nice crossover. So a lot of the Myco people were in all these cactus groups. They'd see my name. They'd go, oh. At the very least, I don't know if he knows Cactus, but I know that he'll give me my money back if I'm not happy. Right. And so it, it became very trusting right there off the bat. And uh, it kind of just took off to a point where now um, now I have like a greenhouse. Uh, right now it's winter, so it's, it's not nothing in it right now. But we have a, a full greenhouse that we do here for Cactus and, and succulents. And um, yeah, it, it was a lot. Awesome. And then cannabis came along just maybe a year ago. And I've always been a cannabis connoisseur uh, all my life, but I've just never, I've, I've kind of always, for some reason, thought that growing really quality cannabis was like really complicated and that it was like really intricate. And right. it's not to say that it's easy, but like I've come to learn that it's, it's with weed, it's all genetics. Like you could, you could go ahead and with a good genetic, you could pretty much abuse that plant and you might not get a lot of bud, but the bud you get is going to look really awesome. And so just over the last year, I went from like one of the worst grows you, you, you could imagine that was just covered in powder mildew and, and the plants were, they looked fucked and everything was awful to <laughs> this last grow. I was super happy with it and everything looked, it looked amazing just by the eyeball. And then it was amazing to taste and, and we just grow uh, to press our own rosin. And so, um, cause rosin is so goddamn expensive out here at the shops and stuff. And it's a, it's a treat I like to have. And so that's pretty much the only purpose we grow for is just to be able to uh, treat ourselves to, to our own concentrates throughout the year. That's awesome. The, um, about the cacti, I thought the, I thought the way people got into, uh, various cacti was that if you were really hardcore into mushrooms, like insanely hardcore, then you would get a letter one day from a secret organization that said, okay, you're just crazy enough. 
we think you should start growing cacti now. That's no, how I, I thought it worked. I've been waiting for my letter. I haven't gotten it yet. But I'll no, give you, you know what though? I, I can go ahead and I, I'll send you a letter though. I'll okay. send you a letter for <laughs> approval to start collecting cacti. Oh, it goes weird. quick. It goes very quick. I regularly have people tell me I I I went ahead and I got my first cactus last last week and and you know I'm already well, thinking have- about. <laughs> growing a 10, it, it's growing a full setup with a tent and everything yes i know people that are like oh, i just you know thought i was gonna just dabble and now i have four thousand cacti and i'm like yeah no, yeah wait, it you're goes joking, quick. Right? The, the problem is the seeds are so extremely affordable and uh and and so you can go ahead and for you know very like 20 30 bucks you can go ahead and get 100 seeds and 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 get them all going and and have you know with good germination race you're gonna you're gonna have a lot of cactus really fast yeah so they get awesome they come and they go and i just love seeing them when they're little they're just they're adorable they're like little labradoodle succulents it's all about the flowers too and people don't a lot of people go huh what are you talking about and that's 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 the beauty of any cactus and Mm -hmm. all cactus flower and their flowers are are massive and large and gorgeous. That was the one thing I didn't get you pictures of. I didn't get you any cactus flower pictures. No, we'll do that. We'll do that next time. We'll, we'll do. <laughs> we'll do a cacti special. All right. Um, that sounds okay. Good. So mushrooms were your first. I love the myco origin story. Um, you you guys are churning out an insane amount of swabs. Um, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about. Um, in the last three years, what you've learned about growing, like, are you a bag or tub guy? Are you a tent or a, a, an open air guy? Like, just walk me through some, some of the basics. Like okay. How, how you like to grow. So I'll, I'll start with the way I like to grow typically is, is however works best at like for me at that time. Mm-hmm. So when we first started growing, when we very first started selling spores, um, we still were in a carpeted room. We, we had a, a four by a two by four flow hood sitting on a large wooden dresser. And uh, you know how most dressers have the, the pull out for all of the uh, little, um, not even, a, not, it wasn't a dresser. It was just a, a, a desk. And you know, the pull out for all your little pens and everything that yeah. comes right out in the center of a desk. Mm-hmm. I went ahead and I put like a pl- piece of plywood so that would pull out and be the same level. And I could work on that. And the flow hood was basically just like way larger than I even needed. And we started, we just kind of evolved bit by bit. And I think right now my whole lab is inside of a tent. And that's only because my lab is inside of a shop that's so large to heat it wouldn't be feasible. Right. Um, before that, I just had a, I had a smaller lab that heating was no problem. And, and I just kind of did like an open air grow where I would go ahead and I'd have, uh, just shelves in the room and the tub sitting on there. I didn't worry about necessarily having a a super enclosed space, but it kind of just depends on, on what's going to work for you at the time. I feel like you can make anything work. That's true. Um, yeah, I was talking to a guy today about, what was it about? I think it was about, uh, flow hoods and, uh, he, he was like, but but will I get laminar flow doing this? And I was like, you might, you might not, but you will be able to fuck with mushrooms in front of this thing. I can tell yeah. you that. But I'm always telling people, I had a buddy the other day I was talking about, he he had one of those, those I, I'm, I'm so bad with the words for things, but uh, one of those wind readers, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, an anometer. Thank yep. you so much. Yep. I really appreciate that. So, and he was saying, oh, my flow hood's not meeting specs. I got it off Alibaba. I'm going to trash it. And I use an Alibaba flow hood all the time. I, out of the three flow hoods I have, only two of them are US made. And so I'm in front of an Alibaba, Alibaba flow hood all the time. It's just some China flow hood. And it definitely wouldn't meet any rate specs, but I can go ahead and do agar work in front of it. I could pour a thousand dishes and, and have, you know, a contamination rate of, two percent or less right and so tell me it's not working you know what i mean yeah this thing back here is just your basic run-of-the-mill ffu and jerko mac 10 industry standard but what people don't realize first off is they're designed for the ceiling of a clean room absolutely they're they're just air scrubbers yep people use them in the same rooms as surgery and stuff yeah 
we hacked it and we just said, well, we're just going to take these things and set it on their side and work in front of them. But the, the air velocity coming off them in the center versus the edges is very different. So there's nothing laminar about the flow at all, (laughs) but it works. Absolutely. Doesn't matter. It works. If your filter is good, it's fine. Yeah, and then I, I remember one guy one time was like, well, I measured it, and it, it, it's four you know meters per second too low here. And I said, dude, why don't you just take some plates, put them in front of your flow hood, open, up, open them up for five or ten minutes, let them grow out, see if it works or not. And he, uh, a week and, like, maybe two weeks later, he goes, well, here's a picture of the plates. There's no contamination anywhere yep. except for, like, a little bit far out. And I said, well, then it looks like it doesn't freaking matter it looks like it works that that i think is the lesson a lot of people uh i think it's a personality type too where they're they're into numbers they're into data and and all that stuff or process and they just forget like people over obsess does it work (laughs) it works it's okay it does not matter anyway um Dang, I, we got we got some scandalous comments in the in the discussion here. Holy crap! Oh goodness! Wow. Let's Guys. see. I can't see no, anything over it's here. All, um, I don't even know who this dude is. Anyway, it's ridiculous. Um, you don't sell as many spores as I do without getting a little bit of hate. So it's nothing don't. that I haven't seen before. I'm sure. You Where do I see? Oh, the it's comment? not even you. It's me. I've never, I've never oh. had somebody attack me on on the podcast. Sorry, it's what I get for just like glancing over at a, at a long comment. No, you're um, fine. I, I definitely assumed it was for me. <laughs> no, no, um, but you are right, and we will talk about that in in the ethics section about uh, you know, you can please some people all the time or all the people some of the time, but you cannot please all the people all the time. It no, you can try, happen. but it won't work. <laughs> you can try, it will definitely not work. Um, so, wh- what does your day look like? Because you guys are now, I-, I think, moving a fair amount of swabs, and your your days are pretty busy. So, I, I think some people would just love to know, like, what a day in Nikki's life looks like. It's a day in my life. So, uh, we've got kiddos. So, a day in my life pretty much starts with getting a kiddo off to school. And I'm fortunate that I don't have to do a whole ton of that. Um, Susie goes ahead and, and handles a, a very large portion of, of the morning for me, um, which I'm very blessed yeah. to have that happen. And so I wake up on the tail end of a kiddo leaving for school with Susie. And I pretty much sit down on my phone and we have a really large Australia and India and a couple international presences where people are buying a lot of spores. And so I'll usually get a good amount, maybe 10, 15 messages overnight from international customers. And so I'll usually sit there in the morning. If I get up early enough, there's enough overlap where I'm talking to them for a little while. And so I usually chat with uh, them for a bit on my phone and send any website requests that I can. And the phone really can trap you. That can that can suck oh, yeah. down two hours in the morning. Just, yes. you know what I mean? Sometimes I, I'll justify it because I'll sit there and I'll see someone, you know, those they'll have the three dots just sitting there for an extended period of time. And, and you'll, right. you'll go, okay, they're about to reply. And so you'll switch over to like a reel on Facebook. And you, and then all of a sudden, the next thing you know, you're you've been watching Facebook Reels for two minutes or whatever. So that in the morning, I usually sit there and try and respond to everybody I can and take care of any uh, any customer emails. And then um, I'm usually checking things out. Recently, we just relocated labs, so okay. days right now are basically going in, making sure everything's good with Susie who runs all the website and runs the Instagrams, making sure there's nothing she needs from me. And then I'm off to the shop where I'm, I'm trying to go ahead and, and I'm getting a bunch of really cool stuff done at the shop right now. Um, everything okay. from, I'm trying to get my own full, full uh, category of, of mono carry ons to start doing some of my own crossing work that I've been working on. And then uh, a lot of the isolation work. And then, um, we just recently started, uh, we got a very large autoclave in, which I've been super excited about. Nice. Um, and so, uh, we've been basically 
pumping out grain bags as fast as we can. We got some up on Etsy and that's been going. We went, we went ahead and just put ourselves the cheapest listing on Etsy that there was. And that's been going really good. Nice. Um, and just prepping everything I can for, uh, for the new lab to be as perfect as possible. Then usually after a couple hours there, I'm on my way home. Um, I don't have any service there. So I have a barrage of messages there and it gets absolutely insane. Uh, some days it's it's 50 messages. Some days it's 75 to 125 messages just in that eight hour period that I'm in the shop um, eight, or less than eight hours most of the time. Uh, so then I usually my phone starts dinging so fast and I'll see something that will like give me a tiny bit of anxiety. I'll see someone have an issue with an order and I'll pull over. And there's a spot I pull over on the way home typically. And I sit there in my car and I'll go over messages like fucking crazy and uh, make sure that everybody's as happy as they possibly can be. And then I'll hop back in the car and I'll drive home. I really like to go ahead and, and when I get back into the house, I really like to try and like toss my phone in a place where I can't see it light up and spend a little bit of time with the kid. Uh, so I get home. Sometimes I'll sit in the driveway for a little bit because once I go into the house, I really like to be done. So I'll, I'll do a last little reply. I'll even call Susie from the driveway and ask her, hey, is everything good? Is there anything that you need from me? Should I sneak around the back, like to our lab? Like, what, what should I do here? Um, anything else I need to do? Do I need to prep any solutions for you? Um, is there anything? Yeah, basically, is there anything I can do before I come in? Because once I come in, I'm done. And then I'm pretty much done till 8.30. And then I'm back at it. At 8.30, I pick the phone back up. And I, if I haven't hit our sales goal for the day, I am going to make sure we do. Wow, I just got tired hearing all that. That's a lot, <laughs> dude. No, I I get it. I got three kids. I in in a a, a day job and and a, and all these little things that I do for fun. So life's a it lot. Is, it it is a lot. Life is a lot. I just talked to somebody the other day who, or I think it was today, who was like, um, "Yeah, just got laid off. I got I, you know I got one more week. I get a new job, and oh, and my landlord." you know, is doing something with our, our apartment. So now I got to find another place to live. I'm like, Oof. welcome to life, bro. Yep. <laughs> That's how life goes. Just when you Oof. think you got it figured out, it's gonna, it's gonna bend you over. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That's why I try to remind myself. I never have it figured out. <laughs> yeah. You, well, you, you can have it figured out today in this moment, but, but that looming down the horizon. Oh, no, dude, I, as soon as else. I start to feel it, I feel that that yeah. hand on my back bending me over getting ready exactly yes <laughs> Sneaking um out. so uh so bags or tubs uh right now i run i got rid of jars right now i'm in love with bags just because i'm 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 done with any sort of lid failure with okay. jars right. yeah I, i've gone from modded jars to non-modded jars to non-modded plastic to non-modded metal to to the filter discs and i'm i'm done with jar lids i'm done with jar mm -hmm. lids which is why i switched to bags but i still prefer tubs um i've never fruited in bags so okay. i'm kind of right, biased so you're there a tubber. you're a tubber but i definitely tubber. tubs over a martha or a tray tray and a martha any day i think okay. that's just impractical and silly so you go ahead and try and maintain such a large environment. Well, you couldn't. And, you, yeah. Yeah, and then and then to go ahead and I see people do it all the time in, in the bulk. You know, uh, in Oregon now, a lot of permits were given out for for large mushroom grows. And so I, I've seen them on Instagram. I've seen them on Facebook, these, you know, 1,500, 2,500 tub grows. Right. Uh, and I've seen people doing trays in these massive rooms. And all I can think of is you are probably spending – $2,500 a month to automate this entire room. Right. And all you're doing is the same thing that that plastic tub does. Right. Yeah. You could, you could do the same True. thing in the plastic tub and the plastic tub does not cost money to automate. Right. But it doesn't, they just want to, you know, they got to feel special somehow. So that's no, that's, that's going to be a big move out here. I've already gone ahead and I've, I've had two different places have me come out and they've basically just been like, Hey, can you do a little bit of consult work because big people come in with a ton of money and they see, oh, this is going to be the second cannabis. Yeah. And uh, they they build clean rooms. 
and they do all of this really extensive stuff and then they go we just want to grow a bunch of cubes and i go you don't need most of this you're gonna save 10 grand a month if you just get rid of most of this get rid of most of it you're gonna be fine with just a a, a, you know you don't need a, a a room that has so many HEPAs blowing into it that the the positive pressure is pushing your plastic against the walls without any tacks. Like you, you can go ahead and, and dial it down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, there was a, an account on Instagram a while back um, out of Los Angeles that they, they had a little video and they were walking through their grow room and I, easily, easily 1,500 uh, max yield bins. And uh, I thought, oh, wow, and just and stacked one on top of another. And I thought, well, how the fuck do you get at the one on the bottom? Like, what is that all about? Um, but then I later talked to the some of the people behind it and they were like, oh, no, we don't actually use them to grow. And we put our bag grows in them. So, oh. again, it's sort of like what you were talking about, you know. Yeah. Just why would you want to? Yeah. You want to contain that stuff, right? A Even the bag grows. Plant. The the bags, I like the idea. The coolest bag idea I've ever seen, and this was really cool. Somebody had a large space rented out. Um, I, I'm, I'm shitty with sizes. A large garage size space. And okay. all over the ceiling, they just had hooks lined about every foot or so of the entire the entire thing. Every, every foot, there was a hook. And uh, they'd have a line coming down. And they'd have bags and they had them safety pinned to the line. So the entire room was just lines of bags coming from the ceiling. And uh, and each line probably had 15 bags or so on it. And as far as using all of the space in the room, I, I've never seen anything like it. I always thought that that was cool. Well, as you and I both know, there there are guys in this community who, like you said earlier, they will overthink something, and usually it's just that. And every once in a while, it really works out. And yeah, it's cool stuff. I'm definitely guilty of being an overthinker. <laughs> yeah, I, I I would say we. That's what we like about. I don't know. Some people they just get their text and then they don't want to do anything else. That you know they don't want to mess with anything. But I'm always kind of thinking, well, could I do this? Could I do that? And <laughs> yeah, I, I I go down those rabbit holes for sure. Um, all right. Well, we're about a half hour in, and this is when we uh, usually get into our behind the veil. Um, all right. I, I thought you have quite a few isolations and crosses and. Uh, cultigens to talk about so um... no crosses actually those are all isolations okay. or i okay. guess no one crosses. was one was a cross attempt long ago okay all right isolations there you go here we, here we go i don't want to claim something i haven't done <laughs> uh, it's okay don't worry it's only a matter of time now every everybody's now that we got i don't know if you've heard about this new uh spore germination technique that ed ed's been showing everybody i mean i i'm I'm throwing out monos. I can't. I'm getting too many. I don't even have to try. It's it's ridiculous. Oh yeah. So, uh, yep. We're all going to be mono crossing, and hopefully one of these days, you know, in in like two years, we're going to go. Remember when you guys thought toke looked cool, and like <laughs> now it's like you know, little shop of horrors craziness. Uh, I well, I'm ready wait. for it. I'm ready for it. I cannot wait. All right, someone so, can find uh, something, yeah. If someone can find something more impressive than Toke, I can't gonna, wait to see it because that either it's that thing badass. looks that thing looks like it's gonna hurt me. Yes. Well, so <laughs> I'm gonna I want to start with uh, a cultigen that that kind of reminds me of Toke, to be honest, uh, for for a few reasons. Um, how about we start with Solmac? All right. All right. I'm gonna pull it up. Let me, I gotta pull off the uh, overlay here. Give me a second. Yeah, Solmac is probably the most recent and the, the best selling. It's cool, man. So uh, I, I don't know if I got the orders of these right. So um, you, there was there was no order to them. Okay, I don't think okay. I had time to, to sort them out for you all the all way. Right, cool, okay. You're starting with the worst picture, though. I tell you that. Right. No, I know. I think they're actually <laughs> towards the end here. Let me. How about this one? I like that one a lot. Yeah, people yeah. always, everyone always said that looked really chicken in the woodsy. And I wish, uh, I wish I had seen more of this exact expression. But, uh, but uh, yeah, this is. 
this I, that's one of my one. favorites. This is probably my favorite. Yep. There this we go. right here is, it lives up to the name the best, I believe. It's so back started. Stolback started pretty interesting, too. Stolback was one of the ones where, like, I didn't really see anything special until uh, until I had posted it, and I don't even remember which group, but it, it blew up. It ended up being one of, like, the most seen posts I had, and oh, someone yeah. commented under it this beautiful poem that I had to hit Google Translate because I don't speak Spanish, okay. uh, this beautiful poem, and at the end, they said something like, long live... Soul Mac, but I didn't know what Soul Mac meant, and I, I remember having this short little convo in the comment thread, and uh, them explaining to me that Soul meant son, and I remember mm -hmm. thinking like this, this is pretty cool. That's pretty yeah. cool, and that's pretty much where that a whole name and idea came from. Oh, I like that. So now, are either of these tubs the the first tub? And and why don't you walk us through? These are both. You... These are both Generation One right here. Yes. Okay. So now, so you just got a a unique expression off of what? What is this a Melmac of some sort, or? Yeah, the culture was from uh, uh, a buddy uh, Scott Evans, okay. and uh, yeah, it was a Melmac OG culture. I got probably. Three years ago now. It was probably one of my first cultures. He taught me a lot of stuff, actually. Uh, I, got, I got to give him a lot of credit. He uh, he took me in and, and pretty much walked me through. He, he I remember, I love it. And this is what I do for everybody now, too, that I'm friends with that wants to learn how to grow. I, I will give him a step and I'll say, hey, do exactly this. And and they'll ask me a bunch of questions that are way far ahead. And I say, no, 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 no. <laughs> Just call me. This is what you're going to do next. If you have any questions while you're doing it, call me and I'll answer them in real time. But like, I'm not going to teach you anything ahead of time, just bit right. by bit by bit. And that's what he would do. I'd say, Hey, I'm doing no poor agar. What do I got to do? And, right. and he would walk me through it bit by bit. And then I'd call him, you know, shit, five, three weeks, four weeks later and be like, Hey, I'm putting agar to jars. What do I do? And he'd walk me through it bit by bit. It was the best. I actually love that. I, I never thought about that because they don't do that. I think they, they go, holy shit, I got geeky. He's talking to me. I better ask him every fucking question I, yep. I can think of right now. I never thought about doing it that way. No, because like, I can't where... give people. That's how I do it now. I don't have time to give people fucking every bit yeah. of advice. But yes. I do have time. If you send me a voice message while you're doing agar with a question, I can I can help you then. Yep. Yep. What I don't have time to do is tell you how to do agar grain tubs this that the and give you all the best advice that i have in you know to yeah i can't i can't give it to everybody 100 percent. without without going ahead and what i do and what i should do and putting up more content that's like educational which is something that i've yes. i've i need to do but it's hard when you're busy sometimes it, dude that's that's a pro tip right there because i mean pretty much everybody that i like they they do have the the impulse to give back and to help because they realize that at one point in time they didn't know anything and it took somebody like your buddy being nice and giving you some advice to to help oh, yeah. grow so we all i think we all try to do that um but boy that is a pro tip of just pacing it out yeah <laughs> not giving too much uh that's great um okay so so uh melmac og um some early spores and then uh these real cool looking caps started showing up so i'm assuming you clone those well so i don't do very much through clone um oh you don't okay no i kind of believe that cloning is best just for basically confirming that you have the expression in the genetic you want and it's not environmental uh so yeah, so cool. i will go ahead and i'll clone things from time to time but uh as far as going from generation to generation to generation, I typically just go ahead and take a fruit that has the expression I want, which would, if you look here, the, the, I think I remember going ahead and taking from the top right and the bottom right. Mm -hmm. And I think I don't, um, I was, a lot of the times I'm not awesome with keeping everything hundred percent straight. So I don't think I actually kept those separate this time. I think I swabbed both those fruits and put them in the same cup accidentally. Okay. So I don't know which, of those two fruits, the next yeah. lineage came from. It came from one of those. It came from the top right and, or the uh, the bottom right there. And okay. and like I said, I believe that these were uh, uh, 
F1 tubs. Okay. And then say, this is a subsequent? Or oh, this that is... one. Yeah, I really like that, too. And, I, and, and for sure, um, and like I said, a lot of these were before. I really only started taking uh, the genetics extremely seriously probably in the last year. Um, and it was after a lot of this new stuff. I, I probably for the last two years thought that, you know, crossing was just rubbing two swabs uh, or rubbing one swab on two fruits. It's only in the last year that I've gone ahead and picked up a lot of the microscopy and a lot of everything else. And so, uh, and, and kind of recognized how important labeling, um, each generation is and, and probably how important as a vendor uh, going ahead and keeping photos for each generation perfectly. But this is either generation two or three. And I know that these top two fruits right there on the top left are what oh, yeah. would have gone to the next gen. Nice. And then God, good. I love that one. That, that's my favorite. That's yeah. this, this is my second favorite. Um, uh, yeah, but these are, this was, cool these, too, these were the original. This was what okay. got the poem written about it right here. Oh, nice. Let's keep going. Now, I kind of like this top one, though. It's a little different. Slomac but... was very much, yeah, no, the, I liked these a lot. Slomac was very much something that that kind of only kept going because uh, this, and I had one other like this too, but Slomac really only kept going just because of the amount of encouragement from the community. Because it's really easy as a vendor to go ahead and start to second guess if what you're doing is worth doing. I think that that's something that everybody goes ahead and looks at. Wombat is somebody who's like kind of always been a huge inspiration to me because I remember when probably what, like two, three years ago when he did El Chaco, I remember like a ton of people um, that I knew mentioning like, oh, that's lame. Like, that's just like a darker cube. And uh, I, I remember at the time thinking like, like kind of going with the crowd thinking like, yeah, that is just kind of a darker cube, isn't it? And and come to find out Ch El Chaco is like one of the most potent or come the Chaco lineage is one of the most potent lineages that have been tested and, and, you know, come to find out it's, it's adored by all. It's my favorite printing mushroom to this day now. And, and that kind of inspired me to start looking at uh, traits and aspects of mushrooms that I used to be really critical of things. I used to say, that's not worth isolating. I kind of now will go ahead and look at it and go, Oh, well, I like oh. it. So, <laughs> and other people like it. So, yeah. That's like, uh, that's absolutely true because we might have an affinity for one morphology and we might hate another morphology, but somebody might be the complete opposite of that. And yep. Yeah. If you're breeding and you're trying to present new stuff to the community, I mean, oh, I just remember I thinking, think froze right there. I remember thinking that's such a dark, dark brown. Like, even though, yeah, it, you know, it, it was a little basic, but. No, that was that was browner than any brown. Oh I've yeah, ever seen. and they're hairy like as hell. They look they yeah. look like they're furry. Yes, probably the coolest trait of those. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I love um, I love all the everything Chaco. Uh, I think he said uh, on his podcast something like, "Oh, I even pursue the traits I don't like." Yeah. Like I, I asked him some about that. Oh, I pursue the traits I don't like. I'm like, yep. Oh, okay. No, he's Ways been a huge to think inspiration. Like him. Yes. Anytime I'm second guessing anything I do, I, I'll try to remind myself. Oh, if Dave wanted to do it, he would just do it. He wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, he wouldn't give a shit if anybody thought it was worth doing. Right. And, and you I know, like that. I mean, he's. I remember. I can't remember what cultigen it was, but he was like, "Oh yes, yeah, so I just cloned this weird thing, and and it was from that point on incredibly stable." And I'm like, "Oh my god, I would have thrown that." You know, that would have just gone in my dehydrate pile. I would have not ever, I would have thought there's no way I could reproduce that quality. Yeah. I would have assumed it was environmental, but he's like, yes, just goes for it. I love that. Yeah. Uh, all right. So let's, we'll finish. Um, so now is this a newer grow or is this one of? Many? I think this is one of the, the you've already shown uh, a different angle of this grow right here. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, I yeah, should have yeah. gotten you. I should have gotten you another photo of a, a more recent one because I just put I just put up a Soul Mac Grow on my profile maybe nice. two three days ago. That was 
absolutely banging of Generation 4, and I'm not sure why I didn't get it to you, man. Well, there's some homework right there for all you Soul Mac lovers. Or, or oh, yeah, Soul Mac yeah. Lovers. You, can, you can go check out on, on Facebook. Yeah, um, Generation 4 is up there, and it's it's a banger. It's a banger. Nice. All right, so let's, let's move on. Let's go to... Um, uh, another one that I have grown, and, and I actually really like this one. Um, let's do SSU. Okay. Yeah, this is, oh my gosh, yeah, I, I really love Mar- Marlboro Gomez. Did mm-hmm. all of this art. He's uh, he's from a little village in Mexico, and he did all this art for us in the, in the beginning, and, and I absolutely awesome. love it. <laughs> I do too. All right, so uh, I had to do that. Yeah, these. So this was my. Uh, this is the only time I've ever done a cross attempt and ended up releasing it. Mm-hmm. And this was I at the time was working on a Melmac, um, Melmac squat, and I actually kind of rage quit on it because I was working on it. And I got into about Gen three, and things weren't as perfect as I'd liked. And a uh, a fellow cultivator under the name Felonious Crimes. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, great cultivator amazing dude uh agree relief been, been trying to get him on the show well we'll see if it he's 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 a hard guy to get anywhere but he, he, he should committed come on. He and should. then he said we got to postpone so yeah Felonious. no he should he should get on so he yeah he one of my favorite strains now um he really squat knots which is a yep. melmac revert squat yep and That's so i idea. i abandoned that project i wouldn't abandon it now that was earlier and it was part of that whole me doing things that I thought people cared about instead of doing things that only I cared about. And so now if, if it was now I would have released a, a Mel Mac rebirth squat under a different name and me and felonious crimes would have, would have shaken hands and loved yeah. each other about it. Yeah. They're guaranteed. But uh, uh, right now he's a great friend of mine and he released that squat knots and it's one of my favorite variants. And we always were anytime we're able to, we always have it listed Anytime we're able to go ahead and outsource anything through him, we're always trying to, but dude's busier than you could imagine. <laughs> and uh, so this was a Melmac revert squat crossed with the same ape culture that uh, Lape and Albino Monkey Dong mm-hmm. <laughs> came from. Um, and it showed some expression of being like a, a smaller fruit, um, but I don't believe that there's any chance that it actually is a, a, a true cross of the two. I think that naive me at the time kind of thought so. And I think within six to eight months of uh, establishing it as a cross, I had come back and kind of gone ahead and announced that it wasn't a cross uh, or that I, it likely wasn't. And that uh, I was probably going to discontinue it. And I had just an overwhelming, that, that post just blew up. And it was just overwhelming response of people saying, don't discontinue it. We love squat or we love uh, SSU, sunny side up. We love uh, SSU. It's one of our favorites. Um, they're extremely potent. And so yeah. I went ahead and, and said, okay, well, we'll go ahead and, and keep them going then. And, uh, and we have, and when the, we don't have them in stock often because it's not, the most rewarding grow. It's definitely not by any means a yielder. It reminds me a lot of ghost, uh, but it comes from an ape lineage instead of a TAT lineage. Um, but uh, yeah, they, uh, when we do have them, they sell out immediately. It's a, it's definitely one of our fastest selling of, of anything. Soul Mac, we, we can go ahead and we can announce it. And we'll have it for a month. Lape, we'll have it for two weeks, but SSU sells out within two days every time. I love it. Uh, yes, potent. Um, I just, I think <laughs> I've, I, I think I've gotten used to. Um, I'll tell you what a, a criteria that I really use for for cultigens is harvestability. Yep. Harvestability is a big deal. I don't no, care absolutely. What anybody says. And then the other thing that's a big deal <clears throat> is um, once you've dried the fruit. Uh, it's I call it like the shake in the bag test. If you put a bunch of fruit in a bag and you shake it up, are they all going to break to crap and look like junk? Or are they going to stay looking like dried it says fruit? You, I, I, yes. I, I don't normally talk about bag appeal, but they keep their bag appeal. Yeah. 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 Some people say bag appeal. I just say like, just like I love growing Melmax, but they freaking fall apart once they're dried yep. up. 
the big yep. old caps crush and crumble yep. and yep. yeah it's i mean even like the dc mac line which is absolutely one of my favorite lines to grow um the problem with it is if and i like to wait till the caps open up yeah then they're impossible you're just you're gonna destroy them. believe me i know there's there was a time that we didn't compost all of our fruits you know yeah, yeah. and and at that time we would always have to let everything open up all the way because we were harvesting spores. Right, you had to. And so I've, I've I've felt the pain of having caps obliterated inside of a bag. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's why I like that. I like ODPE. I like Ghost. I like all those little. Oh yeah. Small. The squat knots. Bodies. I don't know if you have you ever seen a squat knot uh, dried. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, they are by far. I think yeah. the. I, I had a buddy cultivate some not that long ago and he had, you know, a 56 quart monotub. Mm-hmm. I think he had, he had, he got a quarter pound of it out of it. He had probably 12 to 15 fruits, you know, and they're just all, you know, just the size of your fist. Yep. And he just reaches in, grabs it, twists, pull. Yep. That's the perfect harvest. You know what I mean? Nice. So I know what you're talking about. Nice. No one wants to sit there and I love, like, I love Jack Frost and I love, let me think of another one. Like I love Jack Frost. I love Avery's. I love, um, any of the the like the original TATs, but you let those go a day too long, right. and harvesting those is a freaking mess. You might as well just grab a butcher knife, shave it off, and say "fuck the tub." Yes, you. Yeah, I don't even bother with a second flush on anything that I, starts falling apart. Nope, I don't either. <laughs> the first clump that comes out and rips out a big chunk of sub, I'm just like, yep. no, okay, you're done. Yep, sorry. And I knew that. You mean it can make you hate? It can make you hate a stain. It can. Yes. Um, all right. So where, where are we going to do next? Let's see here. Um, well, how about we go uh, lay. Oh, yeah. Let's do it. I love, I love these great. graphics. Had to include the graphics. They're so cool. Please tell me you that. have shirts of all these graphics. Another. Uh, yeah, we do. And another one from uh, Marlboro Gomez. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Oh, all right. I don't get it. Why did you name these Lape? Explain so, to me. so uh, at the time, honestly, so these were like really early. These mm-hmm. were like three years ago. And at the time, Yeti had just come out and there really were no long penis shaped albinos. Right. There, This was before the, the any of the TAM projects. So before Pearly Gates, before True Albino Melmac, yeah. before AM, uh, a- AMVP. So at the time, a long ape seemed really significant. Like it sounds like a very, you know, not very put together name now. I can admit to that, but no, it's right. perfect. Long albino penis and the yeah. differ- differentiated it from anything else on the market. And so, and I also was a lot less creative back then. So, uh, no, Link. that's, it's the right name, dude. I mean, <laughs> yes, I get it. It's simple. But it's the right name. Usually the yeah. simple is the right And honestly, this name. is my biggest success. As far as, like, I've gone ahead and probably put out more lape swabs than anything else, and they've come back with better results than anything else, and people love them. And it's probably the number one coltagen that, that I have that is, like, every you always hear everything critical when you're the vendor. So oh, yeah. I hear a lot of critical things. I think I've only probably ever heard a whisper about lape and and everybody else is just you know blah. yeah man they're cool all right let's keep looking at them yeah please sorry all right so how did uh, but so let's get the origin story how did okay this is a really cool origin story too so the ape that lape uh sunny side up ssu and amd albino monkey dog came from I actually won. It was the first albino I grew. I won okay. them in a sh- uh, the, the shroomery.org giveaway from um, Avery's or from uh, Albinius White, uh, the creator of Avery's Albino, who ended yeah, up being cool. like a mentor of mine and probably my, for a while, like my best myco friend. Um, and I, I, we don't talk as much anymore. Just every probably a couple times a year we catch up. But uh, yeah, really, really amazing dude. And he sent me these swabs. I I won them for being like the most active member. It was my first like right. three months growing mushrooms. And I think it was just because I asked so many questions and I think I made a post That's for awesome. every single question I had probably. So I ended up winning these swabs. I grew them out. They looked nothing like ape. And I had all these different expressions come out of them. And one of those expressions was um, really, really long 
albinos. And I was just astonished. If you look at these, one of the significant things about them, and I see people harvest late way too early all the time. The veil line is that line that starts right at the bottom of my glove. You see that? Mm -hmm. So that's where the veil broke. I see people all the time go ahead and harvest these a day after the veil breaks. And I try to explain to them, no, 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 no. In the proper conditions, these could have three, five more days of growth. And and they come out looking gorgeous. Look at that. I love that one so much. You can see that's my old... That's the old desk that uh, I used to have the flow head on. That's way before. And we, we got all stainless steel tables in our lab now, but this was long ago. Yep. Love it. Love it. Gandalf awesome. vibes almost on that one. Yeah. Ages before Gandalf. Love it. This was uh, more recently. And we got stickers. Oh yeah. Like you know, it. I've got, I got, we have stickers galore. Every order has stickers. <laughs> Nice. Dave Wombat makes all of our stickers. All of our stickers and all of our merch so far is made by Dave. We try to keep all of our money as in the community as possible. So anytime we go ahead and we're adding new variants, the first thing we do, reach out to the creator, see if they're interested in selling bulk, see if we can work something out so that, you know, everybody's getting a piece of every piece of pie. <laughs> all right. So... Uh, I think the last one we got is. I like this one a lot. Oh no, we well we got we got like a miscellaneous file yet, but let, let's do the next. Uh... I love the miscellaneous file too. Let's do this, and you can say it. Uh, I can't. Okay, so it's albino yeah. monkey dick, yes. and it, it, this one was for a while one of the biggest hits, but it seems like this last gen, I'd say about fifty percent of the swabs I've sent out have given enigma-like growth. Okay. which I have had two reactions to. I've had, oh my God, this is so exciting. Have you seen this before? Or did I get this for the first time? And then I've had, why did you send me this? This is not what you said it was. Right. <laughs> so, um, oh yeah. And I tell you, you know what? If I actually have never seen an albino monkey. And and so I've never seen, you know, an albino's monkeys, you know. I get it. But if, but that's what it would look like, right? I'm pretty sure that's what it would look like. Yeah, right? Yes. 100%. All right, let's keep going here. Yeah, okay. I love those gills, yeah. Yep. All right, so, so okay, where where did this come from? What What's the background on it? This is another, so like I said, this is one of the expressions that came out. There was the, the, the lape, which had... PE style caps and uh, and really you know kind of an open cap and, and it really exposed gills and then there was this and and it had much more of a, like a Melmax type to it where it has those ripples you know what I'm talking about I, don't, I, don't know, I call them ruffles but uh, it had those ruffles to it and the gills were were minimal and I thought they looked really cool and veiny and uh, yeah so I went ahead and I made two isolations out of it instead of it just being you know, nice. lape. It was lape and albino monkey dick. Yeah, and these were these were all of three of these were over two years ago now. Oh my gosh! Yep. Yeah. I like them. They look like I've not grown these, but they look like they harvest well. They yeah, they harvest ex- incredibly well. You yeah. can kind of tell with what yeah. stays sturdy and what doesn't, huh? Yeah. All right. So then let's uh. We got a little bit of time, but let, let's Yay. do this because this is kind of where this is where I'm at right now with growing uh, is exotics. There we go. So these Just these weren't grown through. by me, but I was extremely happy to go ahead and find these this last year. I knocked these off my list. I love foraging. It's what got me into all of this. These are uh, Liberty Caps. I'm going to try and say it. Psilocybe Silamencia. I'm probably said it wrong. I say most words wrong. That's fine. You know, we can just move <laughs> past that. But uh, these were, yeah, these were extremely fine, exciting to find. I found these. Uh, me and my buddy Brycelium Myco uh, have been out hunting for these all season. And we have a ton of prints from them. Um, and we're trying to cultivate them, even though everybody says, oh, you can't cultivate them. But I've seen people get, get pins and they abort. But where you can get pins, you can find a way to make them not abort. So, you know, I'm going to make it work. <laughs> all right. Here, let's keep going. Yep. Beautiful. Beautiful. 
I was so happy. I can't even explain. Temp Enzes. I'm a, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm I sorry, pride okay. myself we'll, in we'll my Temp Enzes grows. Um, we, uh, we saw a lot of Temp Enzes prints. Mm-hmm. I'm probably saying that wrong as well. It's lost be Temp Enzes. But right, uh, so yeah. I got a question. I, I've grown them a few times. And by grow them, I mean not grown them and, <laughs> and only gotten stones. So okay. what, what's your, uh, like, if I came at you and said, all right, dude, I, I, I've gotten your, your spores. I, I got no problem getting stones. Why am I not getting fruit? What am I doing wrong? Um, I would say the, the quickest and easiest advice I can just give is Martha. These okay. want a Martha just like, just like a lot of the, uh, just like a lot of the gourmet. Or okay. I kind of modified a, I've always floated them as well. I can go, I can go on way too long about these, but. They like moisture a lot. So if you can go ahead and you can find a way to keep them almost entirely submerged all the way to the top of the cake, right? Um, Without that water sitting still for, you know, more than 24 hours. And you have that still sitting water. It's it's not going to be great. It's going to go bacterial after a short while. Mm -hmm. But uh, we worked out a a small thing where you can't even see it. But in the corner, this is actually, if you look, there's water at the base of this tub. In the corner of the tub, there's a little hole that I drilled the size of an injection port. I pull that injection port in and out as a plug. That's how I drain that tub. And then I will go ahead and rinse the inside of the tub with distilled water once, drain it again, okay. and then fill it up. And I'll do that every 24 hours. And that's a huge part of the Tamps is, is I mean, they're from uh, Florida marshlands. You know what I mean? They're from like wet, wet areas. So, yeah. So so you're, you're basically... And then, giving, and then a lot of humidity. giving it a, a a bath in there, but but yep. it's it's outside of the liner. It's not in. It in, is. It is. Yeah. But it it leaks over. It, it, it does. Okay. I, I pour it directly on there, and that substrate is so saturated right there that if the liner wasn't there, it would just fall apart. Okay. It is. It is fully saturated. But yes, I go ahead and I use the liner to keep everything together. And then the other thing I do right here is I actually have what a lot of people call a dub tub style setup. But instead of having that second tub actually taped down, I hang it a little bit above and I actually have a fogger going into the top of that dub tub. There's a full inch of open air between the two tubs. All that fogger is doing is pumping that top tub and kind of allowing it to mist down slowly onto it. And that's how I got these. People have been asking for this tech forever and I am a terrible person and I haven't had the chance to type it out just because I, I wanted to be able to do it for real and have right. in, you know, I wanted to do it with my next tamp grow, which I haven't had the chance to do, but uh, there's the, there's the tech. Basically there's, there's pretty much the full That's tech. Cool, man. I, I never would have thought of that. It kind of reminds me of Ed talking about, he takes the, the incontinence pads and pours a quart of water in them so that there's just these like wet pads throughout his Martha. And, and that generates this additional humidity no, and, and that's pretty much what it is. I do this with yeah. nasal lenses. The whole floating, the block thing is what I call it. I do it with mm-hmm. nasal lenses too. Uh, and with, But with nasal lenses, a lot like with the Tamps, I allow a ton more fay. And so if I'm doing nasal lenses in a dub tub, I actually rip all of the tape off all of the holes of that dub tub. Mm-hmm. And I go ahead and I float, the, uh, I float the block. And it's just all about changing that water out. I'm sure that there's a more efficient way to automate that other than just with a plug. But um, a lot of the times... I'm pulled a lot of different ways and I just kind of do things the quickest way I can when it comes to just trying something new. And if it works like this, um, oh yeah. I mean, I got the, this, this, these tubs like this of tamps are print mother loads. I get, uh, probably oh, one. Man. Two I mean, the those. caps are a nice size. Everything oh, yeah. about it is kind of ideal for how you'd want it. So that's, yep. that's, so just, you got to soak the shit out of them without soak having the shit out of bacteria. Them. And then they want some humidity in the air. They want a lot of moving air. They don't want to be just enclosed in a totally enclosed tub. And they need some humidity being pumped in. You want that fogger on a timer. And nice. just dial it in, honestly, because anytime I give anybody advice on exactly how to do it, uh, I live on the coastline and I have ocean mist in my air right now coming through my window. So it's like one of those things where what's what works in my 80 percent humidity it's not gonna work for me yeah exactly yeah. that's fascinating so um so how many times did you have them go bacterial before you got it dialed in for yourself <laughs> oh i like... mean i've i've lost i don't post my failures as much as i probably should just to let everybody know that you know obviously i failed too but uh lost a lot 
Yeah. I lost a lot, a lot, a lot of tamp tubs before I got this process down. I don't know if I sent the photo of um, what they used to look like. I think I might have. Did I spend a spaghetti looking photo? Oh, yeah. We're, we'll get that's coming up. Okay. So this is another angle of those. I love these. I love Again, the water is... droplets on the stems. Yeah, it always happens amazing. because uh, of the fogger that I use. It just misses that air so much. And I think they make such pretty photos. So I, I think the takeaway for me, and I'm just thinking about the tubs I've done, I was not close to this level of wetness. This is obviously. Yeah, just... look at those stems. They are wet. These yeah, are some wet boys. I'll tell you wet. what. I've had these fruit on the t I've had stones and this exact culture, the, the actual fruits, the mushrooms grow on the top layer of LC. And I've had these tamps grow down wow. towards the stir bar, open wow. up their caps inside of the LC fully submerged. They like it wet. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, they like to <laughs> swim, dude. All right, so I, hold on. Okay. It's it's Beautiful the spaghetti, the huge, spaghetti tubs huge. coming up here. It's huge Liberty Cap. Yep, these are great. I love that. That is that's a swab sitting next to it. That is the largest Liberty Cap I've ever found. I'm sure it's not you know any record by any means, but I was very happy to find that. Yeah. Some cyans. Those are those cyans we just so luckily. It's so funny the way the world works, but we had some cyans pop up that uh, we we got a property last year and we had some cyans pop up on it that uh, we didn't put there. So well, that was so cool. They follow you guys. Wherever yep, you they just followed us around. <laughs> yep, more of those. Are, yep, pretty big. Just exciting. There it is. There's that. There's that liberty. I was so. These were so exciting for me because uh, they're like not regarded as you know the coolest mushroom to find, and they're really small. And and but I mean I don't know. I was a check off my list. I'm trying to find them all, right. man. I want to find right. every single slosby in the wild. It's huge, huge passion of mine. And so to be able to check these off the list this year, and to check cool. them off the list within 20 miles of my house, oh, that was cool. And without a bike ride. Without a bad grade. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That is a tamp ends is growing off a truffle. I just thought that that was just too cool enough to share. Yeah, that's very growing cool. directly off of that truffle. And I think I even have a photo of it split. Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. And that's what happens if they don't have enough fay, enough yeah. fresh air exchange. Super tiny caps. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they grow like spaghetti. I've heard they taste great like that. There it is. There you go. A little and spaghetti I I sauce on that. there. You're good. I was going to say, it looks like I stole that from, so I think I remember this too. Somebody accidentally posted it. I shouldn't have even, <laughs> I should have double clicked those photos. But I, someone accidentally posted my grow and I screenshotted it because I was like, hey, that's my photo. That's funny. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's that's what they look like with uh, with the wrong amount of fey. That's what this they look like if you grow them like traditional cubes. Right. They just look like spaghetti. You probably get more weight that way. You don't get any spores, mm -hmm. so I don't care. They, um, yeah, I don't know why I want to go eat at Olive Garden now, but. Yeah, those look very know. noodly. Yep, that's more of the stones. I saw a picture recently of, uh, it was just one big stone, and then it had a massive bouquet of, of tamps coming off of it. It was very cool. All right. Hold yeah, on. that is. I like that a lot. I've never seen it until I had, until I pulled that one out. Zappa decorum. Yeah. Ah, that was. This was extremely exciting. I was. Uh, I was one of the first people to fruit Zappa decorum. I didn't do it extremely successfully. Um, not as successfully as it's been done for sure. But mm -hmm. I was very proud of this. I yeah, thought so my grass have... bean casing was so genius. I have two guys coming on who are going to talk about um, they grow all their cubes in their, their cannabis pots. There you go. And they're, so they're going to talk about uh, uh, about that process. But I don't think I will ever do it, but it looks so cool. And it looks very natural. Definitely. No, this was really exciting. And then here's At the time, this was like, a, yeah. To me, this was a huge achievement of mine. Oh, it being is. Being able to get... Yeah. So the loss of bees, to decorum to fruit. And I thought that the grass was going to, was going to go ahead and contribute because I believe Jake Onsid has fruited section Zappa decorum, uh, very mm -hmm. similarly to this. And he had told me that, uh, that it can help out a lot, 
but I think that I just didn't quite do it right. I think I should have put the grass seed in much longer. This is a really slow, slow fruiter. It took about two months from pin to, to cap basically. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, um, I think I put the grass in too early and I don't think I gave it the right conditions. I can grow mushrooms. I can't grow grass. The grass just started dying. <laughs> They look cool. Uh, I got a guy coming on uh, here shortly, um, maybe in a month or two, who seems to have zaps down. So a couple oh. of people were asking about uh, is that Zap Jordan? Tech. No, um, we'll get him back on too. Now this is another dude I found who uh, he's he's got a guy apparently down where Alan and Jordan go to to get their oh, their boy. prints and all that, and he so his buddy lives there and is, sends him all the stuff, and we're supposed to go down there too. We'll we'll see if that all pans out. But anyway, we're gonna have him on and, and talk exciting. about growing them. So, um, yeah, that that'll be fun. Uh, oh, but yeah. these look good. This I, you get a hold classic. of me if you go anywhere cool. Oh, we will. Oh, I'll announce it. We'll make a big old trip. It'll just be a bunch of white dudes in Hawaiian shirts cruising down to Mexico, yeah. dude. I got a couple guides that that have just said, "Hey, Nick, you get a passport, and I can take you out. I can take yeah. you out to to patches of Zappa decorum and and Mexicana that yeah. that are untouched." So, yeah, that's that that's in the coming year for sure. Um, all right, so we did that. Let me uh, let me pull your overlay back up here. Somebody was asking. Uh, we got a question. Uh. Mike wanted to know, uh, can you ask him any tips for growing natalensis? Um, I think you started to touch on it uh, about the fresh air exchange, but yeah, yep. you just give so him I don't cents. go ahead and I don't use any uh, any. Oh, hold on. As soon as I have a nice pin set, because I pretty much go ahead and allow. Uh, I've never, I didn't really touch on all my cultivation methods, but I allow the pin set to kind of develop typically before I start introducing a ton of fay. Okay. Uh, a lot of times I'll have a tub almost sealed up entirely until I start seeing uh, hyphenal knots or, or, you know, halfway form primordia. Okay. And as soon as I see that, that's when I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start introducing Faye to that tub. So I go ahead and I wait till I see that. And then I go ahead and I typically just, instead of ripping solid tape off and replacing it with micropore, like I would with normal cube, I rip it off and I don't replace it with anything. I mm -hmm. leave those holes entirely open, Right. And uh, I just go ahead and I float the block. And the whole idea there is like, I, and with the gnats, I don't necessarily saturate that substrate as much at all. Okay. That layer of water on the bottom is just because assuming you're growing your, your mushrooms in a warm room, right? Probably between my room stays pretty warm because I notice they grow faster. So I grow at like 76 to like 78. I try not to let it go above 80. That's my zone where I'm like, hey, I don't want you up there. You know, get down a little bit. But uh, 76 to 78 is what I like. And at that temperature, that water's evaporating really slowly. And so right. if you go ahead and you leave that water in there and you go ahead and put that top tub down, have no tape on it, you're still having a small amount of water evaporation from your sub, which is what's creating the, the natural or not naturally, what's creating your humidity in your tub to begin with. And that extra amount of water is just evaporating as well. And it's just creating a little bit extra humidity. Nice. It's why one of the biggest tips I've ever have to give people is, is don't open your tubs up because every single time you open your tub up, you're resetting your tub's humidity. And it might take two hours, maybe three hours of your tub being closed right. before enough water is evaporated out of that substrate into the air for your tub to be the proper humidity for your mushrooms to be growing as fast as you want them to. It's true. Any anything that's looking real good, and I'm like, oh, I want to start peeking at it and all that. You're you're you're, you're letting a lot of air out. You just yep. can't do that. Yeah. Um. I also, as a general rule, I'm like you. I I am almost once I once all the primordia come in, and I know I'm like any day I'm gonna see a pin pop up. Um, I don't even think about introducing fresh air until then. Yep. Just because I, and ideally I never open that thing till I harvest it, but that does yep. not always work out, but not that's, always, that's no, but it's a good, it's a good way to just go about things. Yeah. Agreed. But so hard when you're new, right? I, I hear people say all the time, they're sending me pictures every four hours. I'm like, are you opening that tub up every four hours and taking <laughs> another picture for me? Yep. Please stop. It's not yep. helping your grow out. People <laughs> like you were talking about with the, um, with the monkey dicks. Was it the monkey decks? I can't remember. 
don't yeah, know. Say monkey we dicks talking, again, though. Back when we were talking about monkey dicks, the uh, <laughs> like people will. I just had a guy actually yesterday send me a picture of like I'm about to harvest these uh, DC Mac 95s, and they were like this big. Oh man! I'm like, no, dude, those are gonna yep. get way bigger. Yep, let those Wait. go. Wait, you're nowhere near ready to harvest those yet. But people don't know, right? If you've never grown it. That's why, honestly, if you've never grown something, it's your very first grow. Let that go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Yep. Until then the you'll cap see... is starting to be soft. Until that yes. center, that's what I do. Center of the cap, or, you know, you can go ahead and give the base to the stem, yep. but I think the center of the cap is your real tell. As soon as that mm-hmm. umbo, you know, it's the thing that's what they call oh, it. Once the it curls, yeah, what, yeah, once it curls up, that's the, yep. you're, you're, you're done. The, Yep. The the fruit will not do anything else once that cap is right. That's that's the fruit's as, way of saying we've let go all our spores. As soon as I feel done. The, an ounce of give in the center when I poke that fruit, I, I go ahead and I grab it because after that, she's just gonna start looking funky. And, and although I don't really need well. to worry about bag appeal, I'll tell you what: if I take a photo uh, six hours too late, I, I see it in yeah. in the post. I see that. It gets half of the reach and right. and people blow right past it. And I make half of the sales just because yeah. I took a picture six hours later than I should have. And so right. it's one of those things where it's like, it's dumb, but matters. It does. Um, so speaking of, uh, you know, when to harvest and all that, I, I am, I always tell people, yes, feel the stipes feel, you know, they're going to be very firm for a long time. Um, and then eventually they're going to get real marshmallowy, and, yep. and you'd like to harvest right before that moment really kicks in. Um, but I'm with you, especially on like Melmax of any sorts. I love using the cap as the determining factor. Yep. I don't even need to open the tub up because I, I can just tell by that. Or like uh, AMVP or like the Pearly Gates or any of the large albinos where they might, you know, the veil might break and they might ruffle for, right. you know, another three inches. Oh, yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, you just never know. The um, I think that's for for newbies listening. Um, it's definitely important to give it time. I mean, Absolutely. if uh, in these days newbies are like, oh, it's my first grow. I'm growing Yeti, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> be patient, right? Like, just be patient. The, those things are gonna take a while. Give give it give it a chance. Man. Dude, this guy will not let up. It's driving me up a fuck. You off. got somebody upset with you, huh? Oh, I, it's it's dumb. It's just some made up bullshit. It's a loser. Anyway, all right. Block. Yeah, I shadow banned you because you're a useless <laughs> waste of my time. Ugh, pissing me off. So for those of you that don't know, DC Mac and Chris Aaron used to have a a group called Culture Kings, and they were killing it. They also took some great photos, but they definitely grew some amazing fruit and still do grow some amazing fruit. And they they got in a fight, didn't like each other. They split, and uh, DC Mac teamed up with a guy named Chris uh, Black, who ran a a thing called Black Science, and they, they formed a group called Limitless Genetics. And for a while, I was a moderator on their Discord. That's all I did. But somebody who doesn't like me, trying to make it sound like it did something I didn't do. Anyway. I didn't even know that. It's e- easy to hide. Easy to hide behind a little screen name. Right? Easy to be like, anyway, whatever. Fuck these dudes. Fuck them. Uh, can you tell him? Really not liking this. No, I feel it happens. It happens. Uh, let me let me speak to one thing a little bit more positive because one thing. Yeah, I so let's to... go into ethics since we've well, sort of segued yep. into this. Well, this is and this goes along with some ethics, and that's something I always like to touch on because uh, I definitely come on here. And I feel like it's it's hard to ignore that um, we run a business and that we're very business focused. Yeah. And so one thing I like to go ahead and and try and address is. Uh, I probably have, I mean, I I went ahead and I quit my job three years ago to do this full time. And so I have like almost what I'd call like a residual guilt sometimes that the community literally funds our entire lives now. And and we, we obviously, it's not like they're just funding it 
through just, you know, donation. We're, we're providing services. But one of the things that we do that I really care about and that really makes everything feel good for me and it makes me be able to look at success in the future and go, this is something that's going to be good for me. It's something that if it's good for me, I'm able to do good for other people is, okay. is the amount of fundraisers we're able to do and the amount of giveaways we're able to do now. And so we try and, and just about any time anybody in the community reaches out or not even necessarily reaches out, typically it's having someone else in the community reach out about that person. Um, but we try to do fundraisers and giveaways uh, fundraisers for anyone that's had like, you know, if a community member, community members had a, a house burned down or giveaways for, you know, if, uh, uh, there's been a really nasty flood in a certain area and someone's lost, lost their property, or, um, we've done them for people who have had, uh, family members who have had really awful medical emergencies. Right. And it's something that, that I like to go ahead and anytime, that we are doing well enough that we're able to take two, three days off of work, run a fundraiser and put all of our products towards that opposed to putting them towards our own bank account. It's right. something that we try to do. And then something I like, I think Susie touched on this. She was just on here not too long ago, but anybody that ever is uh, thinking about cultivating mushrooms. And for some reason, the price of spores is the only thing standing in your way. We've got, we've got free spores for anybody. We're not going to go ahead and let you go down our website and fill up a cart with everything you want and send it to you for free. But if anybody ever wants to reach out via email, via messenger, um, any of our social medias and wants to let us know, hey, like I just need some prints. We are terrible. And all the time we will mess up and have mislabeled prints and we won't send those out. If we don't know for sure what something is, if we find a baggie of prints sitting by find our flow hood, those get labeled mystery prints and those get sent out to anybody that would like some. I like it. Sorry. It's always like I want to touch base on that because I do every once in a while kind of feel Dude, like. Dude, you're the best for that. I mean, I was just talking to someone the other day and I was like, I mean, uh, let me tell you what Nicky Maiko gets. He gets that people come into this community and they want to have a little fun growing mushrooms. And as as a vendor, you got that dialed in. You're like. Ayo, we're going to give away some shit today. Ayo. Uh, or like when, when you're, I don't know. Hey going yo, yo. It's, right, it's you're going on a camping trip and and Susie's like, uh, hey, Nikki's gone. We're going to do a sale this weekend. Like, it's fun. You just make it fun. Oh, yeah. No, let's hear it. Let's hear your Ayo. I want to hear it. No one's heard yeah. it. This is. It's a, it's a Ayo. And you know where that came nice. from? I didn't know where it came from. Um. I, I've always said it for the last couple of years until a buddy of mine, we, he was living here for a while, uh, Michael Ivy, and uh, mm -hmm. he pointed out one of our favorite TV shows. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah, sure. But uh, they, they start almost about every scene walking up going, Ayo! Uh, and I'm pretty okay. sure that's where I got it from. But yeah, the Ayo all day. It gets everybody's attention. That's funny. It does. Yeah. And, and, and you guys are so good with that. I mean, the giveaways, the giveaways, the giveaways, the, you know, it's, it just creates the, <laughs> the right vibe for sure. Yes. And if somebody's, uh, you know, going through something, uh, that's amazing to do, uh, like, Hey, today, all our sales go, go to this person or, or this. No. And it's been, we've had some that, I mean, like some of them, I think, I think Dave Wombat's fundraiser did probably better, but last time Dave was in surgery, I think, you know, the, the fundraisers do well. They do really well in the community. And and all of, uh, yeah, pretty much all of the community uh, leaders, I'd say, any admins of any group, everybody's so receptive. When, when we have a fundraiser, it doesn't matter who, matter who it's for, but Dave, Yoshi, um, uh, uh, everybody, everybody comes together. And, and we'll go ahead and I have people messaging me, hey, post it in my group. Oh, Squiggle do... Um, there's there's a, a array of people that that come together and they make like the fundraisers are not us by any means. It's the it's the community. Right. All we do is go into a lab and spend five hours producing some swabs. And then Susie spends a lot of time, a lot of time sorting that mail uh, and, and putting all of the swabs out. But um, other than that, it's it's the community that comes out and comes right. together I can put up a sales post and I won't, I won't sell off one sales post two, $3,000 worth of swabs. But when I put up a fundraiser, 
we go ahead and, and we don't take any of that payment. When we do fundraisers, we have every single payment go directly to whoever the fundraiser's for. We have them pay that cash app, and then we just have that person screenshot it nice. and send it on over. But we'll we'll raise two, three thousand dollars, no issue at all. And and that that doesn't happen for me. That's the community coming together for yeah, someone in need. People. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, hey, I did the the twelve days of Christmas. I tried to run it before everybody else's twelve days of Christmas. We went a little long, but dude, I don't know. We must have given away ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars worth of crap. It, yep, it was I saw insane. that. Insane. Yep, that was and incredible. Again, I just came up with it. Uh, well, actually, I didn't come up with the idea. A guy in the in my Discord was like, "Hey, sh should we do a twelve days of Quis Christmas giveaway?" And I think it's really important yeah, for anybody that's in one of the positions where we are, where we have a lot of viewers and a lot of people tuning in, you can go ahead and almost effortlessly, if not with yeah. minimal effort, you can make a huge difference for the community. If you just go ahead and say, we want to do it. Like just recently, um, yeah. uh, Julian went ahead and we both did a, uh, we threw in and gave away, I think over 250 fentanyl testing strips on my, um, that's awesome. yeah, on my website, just as like a, we saw a bunch of people dying in the community. We saw a couple of people lose family members and, yep. and we just said, you know what, dude, if we're a lot of partiers, I personally am, am sober off just about everything other than cannabis and, and a touch of whiskey here and there. But um, a lot of people go ahead and party pretty hard in this community. And if you're going to party, I don't, nobody wants to go ahead and judge you and nobody wants you to die because you took something you didn't want to. Yeah. And so, you know, Ugh. No, that's great. He sells all those. He sells uh, all sorts of kits for various, uh, you know, to make sure you yep. got what Damage you think control. you got. Yep. And we still have, we still have free fentanyl testing strips on the website right now. We are waiting for the last shipment to come in from, uh, from Julian, but we've still got a couple sitting here and we have a, a nice. shipment coming in and then we're, they're all going out. And um, I think it'll be probably be something that I try and just keep stocked and it's free shipping. It's, it's free a free thing it's no no pressure at all there's absolutely no need to go ahead and buy anything from the site to to go ahead you don't feel inclined by any way i've had people reach out and say hey i i kind of want to do it but i can't also put a swab in the cart and it is so unnecessary and so not the point of us doing this the only reason they are on the website is because if we gave away 250 of them and just had people message us their addresses it would be chaotic as hell agreed <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, so I, I, I work in an ER. I, I resuscitate people on a fairly regular basis who, um, hell, they thought they were getting fentanyl. They're not even getting fentanyl. They're getting car fentanyl, which is Yeah, that elephant shit, huh? That uh, shit's crazy. So, you know, these days, I mean, if there was ever a reason to grow your own stuff, <laughs> yeah. You don't know what you're going to get these days. Nope. You just there was some cases of uh, fentanyl and cannabis oil on the East Coast. Mind-blowing. Yeah, it's all over the place, man. It's because uh, they can buy it on the dark web from China, you know, whether it's fentanyl yep. or car fentanyl or whatever, and they can just... It's I mean, cheap. It's like they're doing with the trap chocolates now, right? It's like nothing's what it's supposed to be. We live in a virtual world, dude. I have a buddy who who knows a close friend who owns a chocolate company. He just recently had spoke on telling me, like, I ate some of his chocolates and I was talking to him and I was saying, hey, these weren't that strong. And he goes, well, to be honest, we put half of the amount we say, but it's right. because we have these omega fats and we have these organic gluten free and it makes your body absorb it and. You can't trust any of that stuff. If you're going to go ahead and eat some chocolates, have your buddy make them or make them yeah. with your buddy at your house. Or you don't need to go ahead and buy something that someone bought a label off China, a thousand of them. You know what I mean? Those one up bars, yeah. those all those bars, right. those are just China labels, just labels slapped on any chocolate bar made by some dude that looks like me in a kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just yeah. get it from someone you actually know. <laughs> don't get it from a dude that looks like me. <laughs> Nobody wearing a five dollar Walmart shirt should you be buying any drugs you, from? You got these for five dollars, man. I'm pretty sure out here inflation has them up to like six. Oh, Things are no. nice over there, huh? This is five dollars from Walmart, man, right here. 
No, this is a nice Walmart. I know we, we've made jokes about the Walmart yes. shirts before, but you're very stylish. You're very stylish. I, and you look I brought very good. it back, dude. I retired it, but yeah. I brought it back just for you, Nikki. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. So, um, yes, grow your own mushrooms, guys. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about um, something I am learning uh, recently is you get to a point where, like you said, you're not going to keep everybody happy. You can try, but you're not going to keep everybody happy. So you got <laughs> you, you to you not try. So a, as, as a vendor, as a successful vendor who is now doing a fair amount of volume, what what are lessons? Because everybody wants to be a vendor. The minute you know, the minute they finally figure out how to grow fruits, I get it. You want to contribute. You want to be a, a bigger part of the community, or you just want to make a few bucks. Um, what are like some lessons or some warnings or um, just advice for for people who think that they they want to get in and and do this? Oof. So community is critical community is extremely critical um in ways that like when i go ahead and i explain to someone who's not in the community what i do and the reasons i make the decisions that i do on each strain and variant and everything they they'll they'll think that it's like they, they it's not something they can wrap their head around because the our community is so niche about caring about certain things over others and one of the biggest things that i think is important is as far as like ethics and as far as keeping everybody happy, um, start off with, if you buy swabs from me, if you buy spores from me, likely if you're not happy and, and it's not some insane situation, some, some a crazy abusive email or, or something off the wall, you're going to go ahead and get a refund. If someone reaches out to me and says, Hey, your, your products didn't leave me satisfied. I'm going to go ahead and just probably refund that person because I found that, Arguing with the two to 5% of people that are unhappy is not worth it. But the problem is, is when you hit a certain volume, two to 5% can be a lot. When you go ahead and some days we, we sell a hundred swab sets a day and we'll sell a hundred swab sets a day for a long period of time. And you know what I mean? That'll be in combos. That'll be in this, that'll be in that. But uh, two to 5% of that is kind of a lot and we are in a community of people who are a lot of them here because they are looking for plant medicine and they exactly. are not always um the most stable people in the world i think that's something that's right. not always talked about because we, and i'm a huge advocate for anybody that you know is is going through any mental mental health issues uh, i don't want to ever sound over critical or anything like that but we are in a community of people where a higher percentage of the mushroom community is mentally unstable than if you were to go ahead and just walk into the grocery store and grab some random people. And that reason is because a lot of people are searching for mushrooms to gain some stability. And so it's 100%. not even necessarily a bad thing, but a lot of us vendors, I was talking to Yoshi about this not that long ago because he just recently launched his store and has been going through uh, dealing with person on person emails and, and all kinds right. of stuff like that. And one of the things is, is people don't really think about that. People don't really think about uh, how much vendors go through me and Rosie within the first year of vending had death threats over right. people telling us to lower our prices. Right. Right. Uh, we've had people go ahead and, and threaten um, send. Yeah. We've had, we've had mail sent to my house. I don't even know how, how, we have mail sent to my house threatening mail. This was a house yeah. ago, <laughs> but just just crazy stuff. People really, really, really get riled up sometimes. They do, and everyone is tough on the internet, right? Yeah, everybody's oh, yeah. tough on the Extremely internet. Extremely tough. Oh yeah, I've had I've had people go ahead and tell me they're driving out to my place, you know, right now on their way to kick my ass for for uh, for their swab set not showing up, right? For them to go ahead and, and get a refund because I, I'll never deal with that. If someone's messaging me with some crazy shit like that, I'll just fucking refund them. Um, yeah. <laughs> but then for them to go ahead and... There you go, guys. Pro hack. Threaten his life and he'll give you a refund. 
No, do not do that. Oh man, I swear to God, if I if I get in the access of these, you're gonna help me deal with them. I'm gonna hire yes. you as an email responder. And you're I will, I'll be I'll be a first responder. No, no, but that's no. pathetic. Like, let's just talk about that. We're talking no, about the is. ethics section. It is. It's pathetic. I, I did a post one time on Instagram. It's that, you know, the meme where the guy holds the sign up and then you put whatever you want in it. And it, it was just like, stop fucking doxing people. Like, no. This is not the community for that, man. No, that shit, that shit it's is not cool. That, as a community, every single one of us has to just put our foot down and say, yeah, no, because, because. Some people want to keep that anonymity and some people are in areas where that is extremely important. Yeah. And to go ahead and, and, yeah, and to put anybody's family at risk ever, to go ahead and put any, uh, yeah, that is that is something that as a, as a community, every single one of us has to put our foot down and say is not okay or else it can continue to happen. And I know really good yeah. people, myself included in this community, that have had themselves fully doxxed to a point where I've, I've had to sit there and contemplate Am I going to keep doing this? Right. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, hey, uh, homeboy like to want to bring up limitless genetics. These guys, out of an abundance of caution, um, instantly shut down uh, Discord. We worked, you know, six, seven months to build up that had a total vibe going. And they shut that down. They literally fried their I computers. remember this. All this just to protect the people that were in that group. Wow, that that's like the the antithesis of doxing. That's I like, don't remember. That's I don't we... remember. I I didn't I didn't know any of the details of all that. I remember when Limitless yeah. Genetics had their shutdown, and I but I was on a different side of it. I never knew. I don't know DC Mac or have much of a relationship, but I remember for some reason, anytime a vendor is not reachable, uh, we get contacted. Yeah, all the time. It happens regularly with any of the vendors. And I'll have people message me and basically be like, hey, I've messaged Dave a bunch to get swabs. Right. He can't respond. Is it appropriate for me to now try and buy his swabs from you? Right. And I'll, yes. <laughs> I'll be like, it's a hard time getting a hold of Dave sometimes. But uh, Wait, what? Dave's hard to get a hold of? <laughs> <laughs> he can be. He can be. You know what the move is, right? You What's send that? a caption that catches his eye. I usually say something about women's butts mm -hmm. or something like that. And then boom. You get a reply. He usually replies, where? Question mark, question mark, question mark. <laughs> you get that instant reply from Dave that way. That's a that's a Nicky Maiko trick, everybody. All right, you guys. So that's like pro tip number four right there. There you go. Yeah. And if you really can't go to hold of Dave, uh, me and Dave work together. And I go ahead and all, most of Dave, Dave's genetics, I go ahead and I purchase directly from Dave. And we just go ahead and list on the website. Right. So yep. you're able to go ahead and, and get swabs that were swabbed by Dave from the Nicky Maiko market and Nicky Maiko prices. And one of the reasons we do that is because like I said, we've the last year, the, the website's just blown up. Things have just been going so incredibly well. Um, and we really want to try yeah, and you do it because it's work, dude. <laughs> it's it's work. work. You got to share the work. Yes. No, and that's it. I want to keep everything yeah. as far and as close in the community as possible. That's why our shirts are done by Dave. That's why our, our, we get all the swabs we can get are done by Dave. Susie just probably pulled a 1200 swab week this week at our house, but anything we can get from Dave, we will. Anything we can get from uh, all, a lot of our exotics come from Geoffrey Black. A lot of our yeah. exotics come from Brycelium Myco. They're shouting people out now. Sorry. <laughs> I think that's great. Yeah, I don't think people realize. I have a friend, a local here to Ohio, who who maintains a pretty large li library, and he's he's out of uh, on Facebook as well. His name's uh, Jeff Karras, and it's just a lot of work. It is. I don't. I don't think people fully appreciate. I that. can't grow actively and keep up with more than about twenty variants. Yeah, it's just so, so our website. Work. I think right now has something like maybe fifty or sixty, and for me to keep up with that, it it took a lot of friends. Oh, another Jason Wilson. Jason Wilson is the man. He takes all my genetics. I just recently had this this lab remodel timed up with a fridge failure, timed up with some traveling I was doing. And I lost almost all my cultures and Brycelium Myco and Jason Wilson. They came through. They had all of my cultures that they, they had saved and they go ahead and they, they set me on up with, That's with awesome. all of my old stuff, all of their good stuff really helped me out there. 
And uh, that's where I've been getting a lot of our swabs is we've actually just recently been borrowing tubs from Jason of my soul Mac of his hillbilly. And we've been taking them to our lab and swabbing <laughs> the crap out of them. And like I said, I think yeah. Susie, you guys talked about it, but you got to do that swab Olympics. Cause I think the other day she did something crazy, like 400 swab sets in a, in a two hour and 15 minute period, something crazy like that. It's nuts. Absolutely. That's like when I, I I talked to Tim of tip of the cat mushrooms and, uh, you know, I I just poured a couple hundred plates the other day and my shoulder hurt. I got bad shoulder anyway. Oh yeah. Construction work, but my shoulder hurt and I'm just sitting there going, how the fuck is Tim? He's pouring like 1800 plates a day, every day. How does this guy do that? Rosie gets me with the, or Susie gets me with the, the, the spore syringes. We've been taking some spore syringe orders for bulk websites okay. and stuff like that recently. And she'll sit there and she'll pull a thousand of them. And the thumb, the, that up pull with the thumb, oh, my yeah. thumb will go out. I don't know how she does it. Well, if you want to get good at something, do it a lot. That's why she's just doing it a lot. She's yep. just good at it. No, and that's what it is. It's it's you do something every day, and a lot of people just can't really comprehend that. But yeah. we do that every day, every day for three years. If we're taking a vacation, we're not at home. You know what I mean? If we're at home, yeah. we're working. We yeah. and that's why we try to spend most of the summer. We work really, really, really hard all winter. We try to spend most of the summer up camping. Yeah, that's where we want to be camping. Camping, camping, camping. All work and no play makes Nikki a dull boy, guys. No. He's, he's no, gotta I get, get out in the out. woods like all of us. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, cool, man. Well, um, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, do you got, uh, I, I feel like how on earth have you not announced a special for being on the, right? So, so uh, you I gotta just, have I just, one. I just, I, we focus so much on me talking about sales already. I wanted to go ahead and leave it till the end. But, uh, so first I'll start with, um, Susie went ahead and, uh, gave away a bunch of Stargazer F1, albino mm -hmm. Stargazer F1, which is a new project I'm working on. Yep. So I kind of thought it'd be perfect timing to go ahead and give away albino Stargazer F2 generation two. So we've got like 50 it. sets of albino Stargazer F2 up on the website. Um, okay. And then we also, for anybody that wants to go ahead and place an order, no, no pressure at all. If anyone wants to, we'll do a free Soul Max swab. And the code for that is uh, Myco Geeky all caps. Myco Geeky all caps. What and, and it looks like Susie case. just slipped me a note. Susie just slipped me a note and and informed me that she didn't get it up. She's gonna get it up a minute and a half after I get all come right. off this screen. So all right, cool. That good thing all I waited right. till the end. Well, hey, so we did this last time with the female podcast, and I had a few people message me, I don't know, not even a week later, going, I didn't get my... Give them time, guys. Yep. They, trust me, they'll, they'll get them out. But, yep, uh, absolutely. Well, a lot yeah. of times when we do this, it's a, it's, it's a lot of orders at once, and we always, anytime we do a giveaway like this, they're going to go out after all paid orders are gone out you know what i mean so right. sometimes it might take three to seven days before those giveaway orders go out right it's all good who's complaining about free not me i mean yeah <laughs> if you're gonna complain about free don't don't take it <laughs> dude that's like uh at work um, when, when, when the boss lady comes around and she's like, Hey, I'm going to put in a pizza order today for you guys. What do you guys want? You should see these people. Oh, I want this. I don't want that. I, they, they get so specific about it. Right. But, but then if they just say, Hey, there's free pizza in the break room. It does not matter what is on it. They just go in there and they just, Oh, nope. should not bad. I'm just going to eat this pizza. Yeah, free. <laughs> Can't complain about free. That's how it works. Can't complain mm. about free. All right, so uh, so free Soul Mac with uh, any orders, and then uh, free F2 uh, albino stargazers, which are kind of cool fruits. They got a nice umbo. They have uh, they're in the vein of a lot like Avery's albino stargazer yep. or uh, um, stormtroopers, Jack Frost. But the cap is a little distinct. It's it's definitely its own thing. Um, so yeah, they uh, yeah. came from the stargazer lineage, which. Uh, I don't know even much about it. it's an older cube. Every time I look it up, the only thing significant is it's a it's a Stamets. It's a Stamets favorite cube. Yeah, which it's a basic cube. Yep. It was they one get, of the first I ever grew. Yep. Oh really? Yep. Yeah, I got from Missy. 
Yeah, and that's where our Stargazer yeah. print that gave us the albino Stargazers came yeah. from. Missy Maiko, yeah. an amazing cultivator, an amazing woman. Yeah, man, she's good. Um, I mean, all all her shit just works. Yep. <laughs> yeah, tell, and that's all that matters. I tell everybody, it just it's gonna work. Trust me. Yep. Um, all right, man. Thank you for coming. We'll have you on again here shortly. Um, oh, if you yeah, guys want those it. free uh, albino stargazers, uh, go on the site. Um, and if you guys want some Soul Mac, make one order. You get a free free get uh, free swab set of Soul Mac. Yep. Just add Soul Mac to the cart, and when you go to add it, it'll ask for the coupon, and you use the coupon all caps Myco Geeky, and you'll go ahead and you'll get it for free. Give us two minutes after uh, after this, I get off the screen. <laughs> cool, man. All right. Well, thanks again, and uh, we'll see you later. I appreciate you. All right, take care. All right, guys, let me pull the... There we go. All right, that was fun. Um, he is very charismatic, loves growing mushrooms. My kind of guy. Good times. Um, so we're going to pull up uh, our buddy Ed here. Let me grab him here. All right, what's up, dude? <laughs> wow to, 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 you guys to not, got me like stressed out man i've got like three three swab orders i gotta fill that have been uh, sitting on my bed they're like right behind me i'm like ah like that's the thing if you're going into the vendor category or whatever yeah, which i never wanted to be get ready for it man like i it, it's a lot of uh what do they call it? logistics you know it's oh, like yeah. You get the email orders and you get the, like Nikki's saying, the giveaways. And then you got to keep track of the different social media and it's just all over the place. So I've got like, my bed is like covered with little cellophane envelopes and I've got like, <laughs> people don't understand that it's, that it is a lot of work. I see it time mm. and time again. I saw it before I sold anything. Um, and I only sell one thing, but, um, I would see these people, they would, you know, they'd get the hang of selling something and then, and then they, they would go from selling one thing to here's my website and I sell all the stuff now. And, uh, not everybody's got the, the, the capacity and the skill set for that. And they start <laughs> no. fucking it up. I, I yeah. tell everybody, if you want to get mm. into vending, pick one thing, do it really, really well. Do yeah. that for a while when that is when you've perfected that add one more thing yep. don't don't bite off more than you can chew you're going to ruin your reputation you're going to piss people off and again yeah. in this community that is not doesn't help the community to do that doesn't help you doesn't help the community it just take slow man for sure i think the people that are in it for like the quick buck like the first b plus tub they get and all of a sudden they want to like, be like bam. a vendor a it's pro, like I, oh no man you start sending off dirty swabs or you start like the people who are like i don't write stuff down i mean that's okay that's happened to me i'm sure you know dave and nikki you get the mystery swabs you know it's four in the morning and you've got those swabs sitting there and you forgot to label that one package and you're like oh like where did they go <laughs> yep. and then uh you know maybe a rubber band falls off and then that's that's fine but you know you give those away or you know throw them yep. in for I, that's like some of these guys you know yep. <laughs> these, these aren't mystery ones but they're just like oh you got an extra one laying around you know like i test my swab so i always got like an extra one i just throw it in another package and yep. but yeah it's logistics man i don't know how some of these yeah. uh these people do it like it's a transition it's taken me like i'd say a good six months and i don't you know i get like two orders a day maybe on a good day <laughs> but if nikki's dealing with like hundreds of orders I on do a not day even know how i it's, yeah oh my god it would be crazy maybe Susie's a lot better than uh than, <laughs> than maybe she's the uh i don't know i i don't i mean like some people generally females are a little better at doing this kind of thing <laughs> I, I don't know yeah, i would agree yeah yeah, they, uh, so like, yeah, I, I think you're right. A, lo a lot of women are very good at worrying about stuff. And mm. I have, for me, if I sell one sterilizer a day, I'm, I'm probably <laughs> even selling more than I want to. And I'm like, uh, when I get done making it, and then I'm like, God damn it, now I got to package it. Oh, uh, yeah. Right? Like, and, and I'm just sitting here going, they're doing 100 orders a day. Oh, I can't imagine. Yeah. They must know them very well at the post place, whatever it's like. Oh. They probably, 
And then some people do these like automated things on their phone with the shipping yeah. labels and all this. I, you I have, have no to way. at that point. You have to at that point. I, I guess I'm so. Sure they do. I guess so. The woman here at the post office doesn't even... They used to ask me all these questions like, what's inside? What are you sending? How much is it worth? And now they're just like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> they, they know the protocol. <laughs> Mine is always liquid, fragile, perishable, lithium-ion batteries, hazardous... <laughs> I'm like, it's a fucking envelope. What do you think I put in it? <laughs> Nothing yeah. that you should care about. Yeah, I got a couple lithium-ion batteries in this flat envelope like what? Uh, yeah it's a little uh, bit ridiculous i mean um government employees you know they they pass a test and they have a job for life not again do. nothing against government employees but <laughs> my, my girlfriend is one she works for the government she uh yeah she she talks crap about it like continually about how much it sucks and about how stupid her co-workers are yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> everywhere but yeah yeah the bureaucrats yeah. definitely slow down the minute they got that bureaucrat job Mm. They're set. Yeah. Oh, for sure. The DMV. Yeah. That's the classic. Uh, that's the classic one, right? Yeah. Yeah. My dad. Well, did yeah. that For a long time. DMV manager. I. I. I he how? Came home every night and never said a goddamn word about his job. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> a manager. Wow. So he's dealing with like all of that collective all the stupidity. And the, the people complaining the people, outside sure. the glass. Yeah. And that was probably back before they had the, like, six-inch uh, thick bulletproof glass window, right? <laughs> that was pre – remember the phrase going postal, where, you could, where that phrase uh, came from? Yeah, where they could reach over the counter yes. and grab you. Yep. <laughs> I see now even those ticket things, like the ticket places, ticket wars or something like that. And they go to uh -huh. these uh, places in, I don't know, Brooklyn or wherever outside of New York and uh, – yeah, there's like a fully bulletproof glass there, and there's people kicking off in the lobby, and they're like, I'm going to wait till they get off work. Like Nikki was saying, you know, it's like you, you really, again, if if you upset somebody, <laughs> that there's people that are like stab you for 20 bucks. It's yeah. like in the mushroom community, like you get death threats from a freaking person who's interested in mushrooms. It's like, really? Know, Where are you man. people coming from? Like, yeah. Again. But yeah, or like this guy lot. causing shit tonight. Uh, the the thing he's all mad about. I didn't even generate it. I asked one guest a question one night that I actually thought she was going to talk about something else, and she talked about a different thing. Doc's nobody just told a story. Nobody knows who that person is to this day. That dude thinks I I give a shit enough about him that I planned it or something. Like it's so dumb. Like, people need to get some, start yeah. reading, guys. Read a book. Learn some stuff. Like, just don't worry about all that stuff. And Because you're probably I, wrong. I do that all the time. I, like, I'll be driving. I'll get a little road rage. Like, that guy fucking cut me off. And my, my wife will be like, <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't even pay attention to you. He doesn't even care about I you. No. Well, he doesn't even that's... care about you. <laughs> oh, it's complicated. Usually I'm the one upsetting people because I'm that asshole on the yeah. motorcycle who like right. swerved to the front and like cut yes. in front of you. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, here it's you got to be careful here. They've got guns here too, man. You'll get shot. Oh, yeah. Like if you uh, if you cut somebody off, they you don't want to be at a red light and they're behind you that like maybe you just cut them off where they think you cut them off because mm -hmm. they will literally get out of the car and come up with a gun or a big yep. machete. Yeah. It, it happens like daily. So yeah, road rage is like a real thing. And people are so yeah. amped up, you know, they're inside listening to their, their crazy, you know, music and they're all like, yeah, 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 you know, like yeah. I'm going to F Swap. somebody up. One cannibal corpse song too many. I know, well, no, you know, it actually, that's a strange thing. Death metal has a therapy. See, when you listen, when you listen to crazy, crazy music mm -hmm. about like mutilated dead bodies and like digging up, you know, you don't need to create them. Yeah. yeah, you don't. Like it's already, it's kind of like an outlet. And uh, or, but I don't know. Maybe some people, some people, the ones that don't do weird stuff, those are the ones that like sit by themselves and those are the ones you might need to worry more about you know yeah. like those are the people that are yeah. maybe really unstable those are the ones that scare me Agreed. but uh, they're okay, all, they're so, everywhere so tonight we we were thinking so okay guys we've 
we have gotten far enough with with the DNA that that we're going to wait for people to start exploring it and get into it a little bit more rather than just going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper mm. and not necessarily gauging where everyone is at. So uh, if you guys are playing with Mega 11 or you guys are um, still looking at getting into fungal barcoding, uh, I have a channel on my Discord for it. You can reach out to Ed in his various places that he's at to, to ask questions and all that. Um, but anyway, tonight, based on a few things that we had uh, separately and collectively encountered, um, and based on the, the after-party uh, chit-chat we had from last week's, ep- or a couple episodes ago, um, we're, we're going to talk about sterile technique tonight. Uh-oh. We will, Michael Greens, we will get to uh, Flow Hoods. That's coming up. I got a couple specialists coming on, and we're going to get probably even deeper than you want to get. Um, but, uh, yeah, so let's talk about sterile technique. Uh, you, you know, have a lab background in, in, in research science, and, and I have a medical background, and a, a lot of us have some, some lab background, or at least, you know, I hear about all these guys that come from the kitchen, they're chefs, or they work yeah. in the kitchen. They exactly. also have to worry about being kosher and washing and cleaning, and I think that process, uh, whether it's from a medical lab background or a a kitchen background, I think it gives you a tendency to be a little cleaner and a little more thoughtful about that stuff. So you would hope so. The people cooking your food, you would hope they would be (laughs) a little bit cleanly. (laughs) So, so yeah, you, you watched, I sent you a video uh, a few days ago and you, uh, and it had nothing to do with the sterile technique. I was just showing Ed this guy that was dripping again. This guy was fruiting in his uh, petri dishes and then swabbing the the, the in vitro fruits. Oh, they were catch, fr- ketchup cups. Or, uh, yeah, ketchup cups. K, K cups or whatever people and, call them. And so I was I was showing him that I thought it was like a, a clever l- little approach, and uh, and all Ed <laughs> could look at was just the countless errors of sterile technique that were going on. So I said, dude, we should let's talk about it. I think it's I think it's a good topic. I, I had to stop watching it. I watched it the second time through and I had to stop it. What it was about an eight minute video and I got like halfway through the second right. time because the first time I watched it on my phone and then I watched it on the computer. I'm like, oh, my God, I was having like a like I was getting faint, you know, like one of those things when you <laughs> like look at a really gory like road accident or something and you want to look, but you don't want to look because you don't want to see the dead body. And it's like, oh, my God, like, no. My, I, I feel sorry for my girlfriend sometimes when she's around. Like, I'll be, like, literally, like, yelling at the computer, like, oh, my fucking God. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> and she's just like, what the hell are you, what are you, what, what is wrong? She's, like, generally worried about me, like, what is wrong? And I'm, like, yelling at some YouTube video. <laughs> Yeah, that was but like, you're the reason. It's yeah. because of you. <laughs> yeah, Ed was yelling at us a couple weeks ago. He was yelling at me and uh, who else was it? Mike uh, oh, Shea, yeah. Microdex Mushrooms, oh, and that's uh, James Cruz, and we we all just confessed that as a general rule, we didn't wear gloves too often. And oh my God, we might as well. Have, I don't know what the equivalent would have been. Like we. St- like we stick screwdrivers in, in light sockets or something. <laughs> he was getting so mad. So I was like, oh. let's talk about sterile technique. Let's talk about why. So step one, why should everybody wear gloves? This is funny because I've talked about it and I've, I've not really talked about it, but thought about it. When I first started to do mammalian, I used to work in a, a medical lab and we would mm-hmm. culture in liquid culture. We would culture HEK cells or a human embryonic kidney. They basically, you know, when they talk about like artificial meat or laboratory meat and they want to grow these like layers of meat. You, lab you meat, use liquid, yeah. yeah, lab meat. You got to use liquid culture, and that requires. I mean, you have to be ultra, ultra careful because it's like essentially yeah. liquid culture. And if you get a single skin cell in there, it, it's all it's fucked. It's yeah. basically fucked. Like literally a single because you're growing human cells, so you can't like get a human cell in there because you're gonna contaminate the culture. Viruses, like we maybe we'll talk about more detail about like that. in another episode or something. Um, and also the simple fact your hands have RNAs on them. You remember your D, you probably read through some of your PCR yep. protocols and they talk about not getting RNAs and DNAs in your yep. samples. 
So if you handle a mushroom and you eventually, or whoever collected it, and you take that mushroom and you use it for a DNA extraction, you're going to have DNAs and RNAs and all these bacteria yeah. on your fingers. So you have to account for that in your buffers and, and your various procedures. Uh, and the the other thing is if you're dealing with pathogenic stuff, like I, I didn't, so, so to be, to be honest, I never wore gloves either. And after about three or four months, the guy who was supposedly training me, who did a very remedial job because he was busy, after about three months, he saw me not wearing gloves and he looked at me like I was insane. Like, he was like, are you crazy? Like, we're using like pathogenic bacteria and viruses and transfected cells. We're basically using genetically modified cells that are of human origin. And if you have a cut on your finger or if you put your hand in your mouth or you go to eat a sandwich, you're going to infect yourself. Yeah. So you're I kind of got a cordyceps virus. No, way worse way way worse do we were doing like freaky stuff that i don't even tell people about like what they do in medical research labs people have no idea man like scary stuff way scarier than like cordyceps or like um you know i don't know maybe you're gonna get a new virus like they do crazy stuff in labs that's why if you ever go to a met you know if you work in a medical facility there'll be those doors yeah. usually at the, the bottom doors. of a the, yeah, back kind of like near the loading dock or something and that place where nobody goes and there'll always be like a weird like security key card or maybe two and maybe even a lock or a buzzer. Like there's a reason. That's where they do the weird stuff. Like that's where they do, they do all the stuff like animal testing, the virus stuff. Right. And, and, and if, if you walk in there with no gloves on, you're probably like um, not very well educated, I would say. Uh, under the proper dangers, if if you go into those kind of facilities, and uh, by the way, with our 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 fungi, I don't think we need to worry so much. Um, but it's also a cost thing. Gloves used to be expensive, like you said. Right. Gloves used to be expensive. They used to be like I used to feel quite like a little bit of guilt when I put on a pair of gloves or changed a pair of gloves and threw them away. You know, I live in Thailand where plastic is everywhere. I can literally not eat a single meal, whether it's at a restaurant. Like you'll get at restaurants, you'll get a meal and they'll bring like the sauces for the meal in a plastic bag. And they'll sit there at the table and pour them out of the bag because they also do carry out, you know, with COVID, mm -hmm. everything became carry out. So the sauces that might go with your scrambled eggs or whatever, or your rice, they already have it bagged up. So it's like all modular. So when they serve you at the restaurant, everything's already in a plastic bag. So for a simple meal, like I'll go to eat lunch today and I'll end up with like four bags, like four of the polypropylene bags that I use for my mushrooms. Also the gloves that are being used for food prep. I mean, to be honest, when I see like people doing food prep on like some of the television shows and I... I see somebody who's got a lot, has had a lot of needles stuck in their arms and their bodies. I don't really want to think about hepatitis C. You know, right. when I'm when I'm getting my food at a proper restaurant, if there's somebody tatted from head to toe and has had needles stuck in their body hundreds of thousands of times, I don't know. Maybe I'm paranoid, but I'd rather they wear gloves. I'm with you. Yeah. But I, I don't know. So, again, I don't, I don't I do get triggered because it's been such a ubiquitous topic over the years. Uh, and, and I've had people comment on it, even in my YouTube videos. They're like, oh, you changed gloves three times. I'm like, well, yeah, I just spent two hours making substrate and making right. spawn. And like a 10 cent pair of gloves is worth it for me not to throw away like four mono tubs later. Agreed. For, you know, so, yeah. so I. I don't know. I don't want to get up on some weird high horse or anything about it. But if you don't want to wear gloves, that's your personal preference. But I'm going to wear them. Uh, it's kind of like I joked about two things. Like not everybody takes care of like their fingernails like right. Missy Maiko yes. does. And also I've got buddies here, not to get all gross here. I've got buddies here that they'll come to Bangkok for three weeks and they'll bang a bunch of prostitutes. Sure. No protection. No protection wow. at all. And I'm like, are you like suicidal? That, But they're, I mean, I hate to say it, a lot of them are, they're a lot of British people. <laughs> they, they don't, wow. they're like, no, man, I'm raw dogging everybody. And I'm like, dude, you're going through like two or three people a day, like professional wow. women and 
ladyboys and like all of this and you're doing all that like raw dog oh my God. i'm like have you not heard our news report like you know what these i hate to say i, I should i need to stop saying i hate to say it. um i hate these to say kids, that but if you stop I, saying i hate to say it <laughs> Then I'll, then I'll, uh, I wouldn't it'll be it. weird. I okay. I'll keep saying it. <laughs> um, these kids, I, I hate to say it. They're 20 years old. They didn't grow up with HIV. Yeah. Right. Like they don't know that you can get horribly life threatening diseases yeah. from <clears> sticking <throat> your, your albino monkey dick into different holes, three of them a day right. for you know, are you suicidal? Like these are professional. And then they go to their, they go back to England to their girlfriend. Right. And then their girlfriend two months later wonders why she's got, you know, itches or oh, rashes. Right. I work in an ER. I know all that drama. I see it every, I, I see it unfold. I, know. I see the one guy come in and he's positive and he, he slept with this girl. And then the new girl's, gr the, the guy's girlfriend comes in the next day and <clears throat> I see it all the time. Yeah. Pathogens. Yeah, it's ir it's very irresponsible yeah. and. But so, so no. pathogens on the plate. <laughs> I know that's what that, that, now double that swabbing. Do don't you can double dip, but make sure both holes are clean. Yes. <laughs> and it's only one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> double but, so, double swab, double dip. So uh, here's what I want to talk about because you got me thinking about this. I in my head, I had not been wearing gloves when I poured agar. I'd not been wearing gloves when I did transfers. <clears throat> I'd been still pretty careful. I, I clamshell. I don't hover. I work real tight to my hood. I got all this mm. first air blasting on it. And I would I would say probably every thousand plates, maybe I would have one plate with a little like staphylococcus on it or maybe something a little yeasty. Uh, around the edge and I'd be like, oh, that was my technique. That was, I must have accidentally barely it's just it's touched always it. always on the edge, right? So, so I just thought, I don't even care. That's cool. That's worth it. I'm a tactile dude. I, I, I'm the same when I start IVs. I, I got to touch the skin. Mm. Um, so I was like, no big deal. But you started talking to us about viruses and about bacteria that you don't necessarily see um, but is affecting growth and all that kind of stuff. You want to talk a little bit about, um, we don't have to go yeah. in deep on the virus, I, but, but you, you were blowing our minds when you were talking about the virus. I, I want, I want to say something first. Uh, so number one, you wash your hands probably a hundred times a day, right? I do. Not uh, the, the average person. Literally do maybe a hundred. So times our hands are very, very sterile. A lot of people do not do that. You're right. Uh, and if you've ever worked in a kitchen, you know that people that they go from food to food and they just, right. you can't, you don't have to, I used to work in a kitchen. I would work the cash register and every time I went from dealing with money to food, I had to wash my hands. Right. And after you do that about the hundredth time and nobody's looking, you're like, well, maybe I won't, maybe I won't this time. Right. right? Yeah. Um, so the other thing is, is that when you open a pack of Petri plates, 10 or 20 or 50, they're sterile. So right. when you touch the outside, that's okay. And you open them once and you pour your plate. But when you go back and you touch it again, right. and then you constantly retouch it and reopen it, right. as you see, it, it gets contaminated around the edge. Okay. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's again, one of those things. If, if it, I'm a very tactile person too, but you get used to wearing gloves. And I, I think you mentioned you have to find the right brand of gloves that fits your hand properly. Yep. Yeah. Like those nitro gloves, people, I see YouTube videos again, people using like those dishwashing gloves that are up to their elbow. Right. That's not the kind of gloves you want to be wearing. Um, you know, the ones that they're like, you know, two or three millimeters thick. Those are like work gloves for, you know, like working in an industrial kitchen or something. Those aren't, right. those aren't for doing lab work. You want to get the thin latex gloves. They're quite yeah. cheap. I think they were like eight, nine bucks of a box for a hundred, um, uh, so yeah, it's just the repeated, the repeated kind of contact. It's just like COVID, right? The people right. who will touch a bunch of contaminated stuff and then they put their mask on and get right next to right. their mouth and their right. ears and their eyes and their nose. Uh, and I'm trying to explain to, you know, like COVID spreads through contacts for, uh, fomites. Is that what they're called? Mm -hmm. Spit yeah. fomites, yeah. little bits yeah. and bobs. And when you touch things and then you put those things near your mucous membranes, that's exactly how you transmit viruses. So with viruses, viruses are, are they need a living organism. They need a living cell. And the way they get uh, spread is generally by airborne droplets, fomites, or contact. 
Right. Um, so if you're contacting stuff, again, if you touch it for the first time, like you could probably touch somebody that had e- Ebola, no problem. Right. Until you put your hand in your mouth or your nose or your eye, if you touch something that's contaminated and then you touch other things, especially if you're dealing with like sporulating contaminated cultures, you know, if you if you see something that's got like a bunch of penicillium or, or trichoderma spores on it and you touch that plate, you are asking for trouble. Right. Like if you, if you get if you get contaminated plates, you put on gloves, you throw away those plates and then you throw away those gloves. Yep. Like and if you can hold the plate and unfold, uh, un like That's you know right, reverse yeah. the glove, yeah because you you just don't want to deal with it. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. You and Whitebird had a good. I, and earlier you and Nikki too were talking about the flow hood. It's about technique. So this like right. uh, how Whitebird this downstream flow. It doesn't matter how fast the air. You got your pneumometer. What is it called? The anometer and the pneumometer. Mm, the the airflow thing. Yeah, it it doesn't really matter. Like you don't need like a you know F1 tornado like flying out in front of you. Um, mm. in fact, that'll decrease the filter life, which I think you mentioned long long time ago. You want it on the lowest possible setting if you've got an FFU just to have a breeze. Yeah. Like you just want to keep those particles, the dirty particles, blowing behind you yeah so what uh, let me interject a lot of people talk about the the flow hood test right um this will mm. be from michael greens here he'll like this one um <clears throat> they always say oh you you, you get a bick and, and you light it and you want the you know you want the flame yeah. bent at a 45 you want the bare minimum That's flow flickering yeah so that you can literally see it's just barely bent you can actually have much higher flow and it will look the same, but the flame will be doing a, a faster ripple effect. And you think, oh, I'm good because my flame's yeah. bent and your flow. I can't tell you how many people who've built their own flow hoods. I, I talk them through a failed build and I'm like, I think your blower's too big. Yeah, I think exactly. you're blowing too much air through that. Exactly. Go buy a $30 anometer on, on Amazon. Let's see what your, your air velocity is. And they'll be like, oh, shit. Wow, you were right. It was way too fast. I got to dial this down. You know what it – yeah. I, like I misspoke. You don't want it flickering. You want a steady bent thing. Yep. If Just you can't bent, light a lighter in front of it, it's too, too, it's too strong. You yes. should be able to hold a lighter and literally go along the whole thing, and yep. it, it shouldn't blow out. Um, and you'll notice this if you use alcohol burners like I do. It'll the wick on the alcohol burner. If it's blowing so hard where the wick is starting to like carbonize and burn too, off, too, too much, fast. way too much. Yeah. Um, and as far as laminar flow, that's irrelevant. It doesn't need to be it laminar. Is, it, it just needs it, to be sterile I'm, air. It is irrelevant. Yes. Like laminar um, flow. Like you know where they're getting it from. I hate to say it again. I'm old, and, and they're getting it from the mushroom cultivator. I I tried to build a laminar flow hood and there's like pretty detailed specs in there about how much CFU, you know, cubic feet or whatever, CFM you need it. And it's way, way, way more than you ever possibly would need. Um, yeah. But you remember 30 years ago, those filters were shit. Those filters right. that you bought for 400 yeah. bucks off of God knows where you got them. I got one somehow. It cost me 200 bucks. A two by four filter. I think it was one by four, one by two. It was this big, and uh, it was shit. And it cost me 250 bucks. And I needed like a squirrel cage blower right. that basically would have like run a small house yep. furnace. <laughs> it was yeah. this massive thing, and I had to do it down in the basement. You know why people used to do mycology in their basement? Because it was so freaking loud to run a laminar flow hood. Yeah. It sounds yeah. like you're. You know, you're running a small factory. You couldn't have that like in an apartment. You could not run a laminar flow hood 30 I years c- ago. I couldn't run this if I lived in an apartment. No, <laughs> no, no chance. The neighbors would be like, what is he doing? Is it like a meat processing factory? No. Oh, yeah. And yeah, you just uh, – so that's practical things. And then, uh, gosh, the other micro, – Michael Green, he'll talk about mm-hmm. it. But yeah, but I I would if you I don't know in America I got an FFU for three hundred bucks here like You're it's a full person. it's man it's big it's way bigger it's I think it's it's in millimeters so it's like a hundred and twenty which is like a little it's quite it's like this wide yeah. and like this high I think you saw a picture it's way mm-hmm. more than like you could pred- you can't physically as one person do more work once you get to like two arms width like that's as wide as you need like. Yeah. 
Although, you know, the two by four stacks like the Marshall amps, you know, that's kind of cool too. But I would personally <laughs> love it to be a maybe not quite a foot taller and a foot mm. wider, and I would be super happy. But but I, I everybody's like, oh, I think I'm just gonna get a two by two, and I'm like, okay, the minute you got it, you wish you had. A no, two by four. don't don't yeah, do not get a two by two. You no 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 no. Two by four. Two by four at least. You're yeah. gonna regret it. Like you said, yeah. the second it arrives and you work in front of it, you'll immediately regret it, and then you'll wish you would have paid that extra two hundred bucks for that extra foot. And, like and you know, I'd pick. That's if you really had an extra because. In- you can work. I don't know if you guys saw uh, Mushman 9000s. He's got a custom flow hood he made that it's it's real shallow. It's or it's not very tall, but it's very wide. And he just does agar transfer work in front of it. He, I don't even think he pours it in front of it. It's just for transfers. And he has another one that's bigger. Um, but if you're going to be working bags, if you're going to be bags, yes. all the other things you're going to be doing in mm. front of the flow hood, you, you want the height and the width. You you really do. Now, yeah. so some people don't have room. That's fine. You just got to make it work then. But if you have room, save the I, money. Just save your I, money and get a bigger one for sure. Make make the room. Make the room. <laughs> the, it's the, be, it's room. the best. It's the best. It, put your yeah. kid on the couch or your girlfriend on the couch. Or yes. Just get, get an extra room somewhere. Yeah. Um <laughs> No, but you brought up a good point. A lot of people are in apartments and they have to make a whole bunch of different decisions about equipment and process that I don't have to make. I I don't have a lot of room, but I definitely have some room here in the basement. I don't, I'm not in an apartment building. I got my own house. I don't have to worry about noise, Mm. but some people do have to worry about that stuff. Well, SABs are fine if you know how to use them. That's what like white bird, white bird, white beard, white, white not beard. ink beard, white beard. Where uh, you guys were talking about is that if you develop the proper technique, and like you've mentioned in microbiology labs, you basically work with a Bunsen burner and you have that cone of sterility. I think yeah. they call it, where you you basically it's a it's the same thing. You you want to kind of like have a very very clean table that's not going to suck anything up from the sides and that hot air that's rising above the bunsen burner that's like where you want to work yep and so as long as you're you know you do the whole alcohol maybe bleach if you don't mind bleach smell um if you do that um my friend used to pour like 40 plates on her like computer desktop but she would alcohol the hell out of everything the walls and even if you're going to do that give a little sprays in the air you know to get the particles the the fomites or whatever to fall down and then wipe it again right and then as soon as you're ready you want that that auger at the right temperature and have your plates out everything's alcohol and just do it don't open the door turn off the air conditioner all that standard stuff you can you can do it no problem it's like watching uh, again not not to the reason i'm so meticulous is because i don't want to show people the wrong way to do it Right. Yeah. And somebody yesterday commented on my YouTube video and they were like, you make mistakes. Like, yes, you do drop things. You will do it. But it's how do you recover? Like most right. of most of life, when something bad happens, like you were saying, when the, the shit gets dumped on you one day, it's, it's not about like you sitting there and be like, oh, poor me. Oh, it's how you recover. Yeah. Right. You drop something. You catch yourself on fire. That's the other reason for wearing gloves. If you got alcohol on your hands and your hand catches on fire, one of the f- quickest things you learn is like how to get a flaming glove off your hand in one go. Yes. <laughs> and fire is a fire is a hazard, so people are dealing with carpeted areas. That's a whole problem. If you've got an alcohol burner and that thing tips over on your floor and you've got al- – see, I, I work on, like, linoleum, like, plastic floors. So if alcohol spills on the floor, um, for my students, I'll frequently, like, dump alcohol purposely and light it on fire. And they freak out. They're like, ah, ah! I'm like, no, it's 70% oh ethanol or, or 95% alcohol. I'll put it on my hand and catch my hand on fire and then just be like, here's how you take off a glove in a half second. And and immediately when you extinguish, you, you don't give it any oxygen, the glove goes out. Right. And then it might be like laying on the floor, kind of melting somewhere. But yeah, those are all things like maybe, uh, I mean, I don't know why 
tents, like if you, you know, those Mylar grow tents, if you yeah. do have money to get one of those, do all your sterile work inside the tent, maybe? Oh, that's what Mushman does too. He, um, he's got an air scrubber in there. So he only has that little extra laminar flow or little, you know, mini FFU for the agar work. But the vast majority of the work that he does, he just goes into his little grow tent. The scrubber's always going. So he, and he wears like a suit, right? He wears the Tyvek <laughs> suit, everything. I mean, I don't know if you follow him on Instagram, but he's got the gear. Dude. I've seen. He, yeah, he doing wears that. the suit, and he told me it's a whole. He said he takes a shower and he scrubs. <laughs> So he's sloughing off all the dead skin that might want to fall off somewhere. He he he's all fresh clothes, put on the, the hazmat suit or, or the you know, whatever the PPE suit is called. And uh, he goes in, he closes it up, and he waits a certain amount of time for that air that he introduced to, to be scrubbed again. And he's got a whole process, so he kind of makes himself a little mini clean room. <laughs> Totally works, man. I I just do it all naked, so I I don't know. They, they won't that, let me do that at dude, work. But I, I, are the surgeons ever in there naked? Like you got like oh, I'm about to no. do a heart surgery. Like let me just strip down. <laughs> I I will tell you I have seen a couple. Uh, when I had the, my OR rotation in school, I saw. First off, they make mistakes during surgeries. Oh, yeah. They do. Yeah, Sometimes yeah. they're fatal. Usually they're not. Usually they're things they can hide. And trust me, if they can Clamp hide them, they will hide off. them. They, they are yeah. not trying to tell you they fucked something up. Um, they just fix it or hide it under your skin. <laughs> not lying, guys. It's real. But if, I, um, yeah. but I watched a, a surgeon one time. He was doing um, uh, it was a belly surgery of some sorts. I can't remember what it was now. Oh, it was uh, a guy had uh, colon cancer. He needed a flap, and they were trying to move vasculated uh, tissue from his belly down towards his rectum, basically. And uh, this guy in the middle of the surgery, he was like a bigger surgeon, and he looks around. You could he wear he was wearing glasses. They were getting fogged up from his mask. It was starting to bother him. The surgery wasn't going quite as smoothly as as he wanted it to. Which happens a lot, right? Like you just, you get in there and some people got more scar tissue, more calcifications, more issues and shit gets harder. And he was getting frustrated and he, you, he can't with his sterile gloves, he can't touch his face, right? So he turns to this person uh, behind him and says, can you just take this fucking mask off? OSHA's not going to come here, are they? And the guy takes the mask down for him. And he finishes the rest of the surgery as he's leaning over this person's open stomach and is breathing into the surgery. Now, to be fair, they 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 dose you up pretty good with some prophylactic antibiotics, and and it's probably not a big deal. But like, mm. people are doing your surgeries, and you know, people get frustrated, people get angry, people get tired, people get annoyed. And I saw all that sorts of stuff. It's exactly what you were talking about, where you went from the cash register to um, to some food prep thing, and you had to wash your hands. And there's just a point where you're like, "Oh fuck, do I got to do this again? This is so annoying. Do I really have to do this?" But you are right. If if you want your sterile tech on point, yes, you you have to always do it. Just yeah, it's it. like being uh well like with the food thing i mean you gotta you gotta kind of balance it's like that person just handed you their money you touch their money and yeah money's like, gross now you get, man yeah now money's you're gonna touch disgusting. their hamburger but they're gonna touch that hamburger too so there's a level at which you gotta be a little bit um i don't know you gotta kind of not get too anal retentive sure. about it I, uh, i'm the same way I'm, I'm not trying to be all like mr like go out and buy a thousand pair of gloves or whatever because you pick, you know, like, but you like surgeons, you've seen them. Like if your nose itches, I don't know what it is. Every time I'm making substrate and my hands are dirty, Always. my Always. back starts itching. 
everything. Yeah, my nose. Got, got All new, of a sudden, I got, got something in my hurt. eye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my nuts are in the wrong place. <laughs> something like something's always yeah. in, in happens as soon as I get ready and I got my hands in substrate and I've got a bag ready to like. Yeah, that's it's always yep. the worst time. Always. But you gotta kind of not be. You OCD do. About so it, you know, like, we, I was just talking at work in our bathroom. Oh, you know, because we're so dumb. Yeah. There's the sign about how we're supposed to um, wash our hands. So the the sign is like, my do this, do yours. this, do this. You know, it's like, I'm a, am I a moron? I don't know how to wash my hands. Um, <laughs> but but one of the steps is that after you've washed your hands, you're supposed to use your elbow God. to turn the 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 oh. faucet off right and then i'm supposed to grab my my paper towel that i'm going to dry my hands with and then i have to use that to open the door f to the bathroom <laughs> and i'm like is this the is this how i'm going to scrub in for a surgery because the minute i leave the bathroom i'm, I'm going to start touching things right like yeah like do i really I get it. Sure, it's a high touch point, contact point. You'd hope that the the knob on the door in the bathroom would likely be touched by people who have just washed their hands. It should be cleaner than the outside knob. But yeah, of course, you got to always kind of balance. Like, are, are we being ridiculous about this or does this make sense? I reuse my gloves. Um, I reuse them a bunch. I pretty much reuse them until they tear, or, or if I can tell they're like getting real close to tearing. Um, but I just ISO the crap out of them. It totally works. Yeah, that that works really well. You know, I, I wash my gloves just under the tap water and then and then dry them off. I sorry, my mm -hmm. air conditioner is dripping on my computer. Dude, you need like a flash pan or something for that thing. <clears throat> yeah, well, these guys were supposed to fix it like three weeks ago and they just messed it up. So now it's dripping everywhere. They um, got their last yeah, payment, Ed. They're not coming exactly. back. Exactly. They'll be back next year. Yeah. Um, but you can wash, you know, way if you're wearing gloves, you can wash them and yeah. just I'll call them again. <clears throat> to be honest, mm -hmm. they're probably cleaner if you wash them and then give them the ISO. And uh, sure. But yeah. that brings up another thing. I use denatured ethanol and the, the, the bitter, the de everybody knows what a denaturant is. It's mm -hmm. this horribly bitter stuff they put in. Yeah. So, so that my you uncle drink can't it. drink it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I buy it for like a dollar, dollar, like a, a quart. And they, you, if you touch your hands and your privates with alcohol, like if I spray my hand with ethanol, denatured ethanol, and I touch my privates or I put it in my mouth, it happens almost every day. It's so bitter that it's like unbearable. Like you have to go brush your teeth to wash it out of your mouth. So right. we don't ISO here. We just use ethanol, which works the same exact way as ISO. Right. So it's it's actually like a personal kind of thing too, unless you want to get bitter ass like denatured alcohol taste in your mouth for literally like the rest of the day. You should wear gloves. Yeah. And it'll get on your privates, and then if somebody else tastes your privates, they will taste it. Believe me, it's happened three times. I've had to explain to my girlfriend on multiple occasions why my dick tastes bitter. Like literally, yeah. I think you guys don't believe me, but I have had to, and that, and also uh. even the hand sanitizer that's got like strawberry flavors in it. Thai girls also use strawberry flavored vaginal wash, and so I've had to explain to my girlfriend again why my dick tastes like strawberries. Because you, I you didn't are wear getting, it. we are getting <laughs> some like serious Bangkok <laughs> intel here, dude. <laughs> no, well, it's it's for real, dude. If you don't want to yes, explain I to your girlfriend you. why your dick tastes like another girl's pussy, then I'm like, not, use use gloves. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I don't have that issue. Um, <laughs> I don't have that issue, but uh, yes. Well, it doesn't. I agree. It's, no, that's what I'm saying. Like she's she's already like because it's Bangkok, she's suspicious, and so me of having course. to explain to her till I'm blue in the face that literally no, that's because of the hand sanitizer. Like, right. it's turned into, like, serious, serious arguments. Like, almost, like, relationship-breaking arguments because of an eight-cent pair of gloves. Right. So, I'm so gonna you can give, see I'm why I get give... triggered by this. Sure. This is why I get triggered yes. by this because I've had a long history, and I've been working <laughs> in labs for, like, 30 years. Uh... And the amount of times I've had this conversation with people in various, like, forms is, is like, yeah. innumerable. It's like... I. I 
Now, I'm going to just tell you this, Ed, because I've watched your YouTube channel and I've seen your tech videos, which are amazing. Some of them have changed my, my life for sure. Um, I wear more clothes when I do my college than you do. So I don't itch my junk. I don't think I ever itch my junk during it. If I do, um, I, I probably just re iso my. Yeah, I think that's that's the Actually, secret. You, More you know, to be honest, I probably fifty percent of the time I'm making substrate and like doing cakes. I'm probably like naked. Like I said, I've seen your videos. I put on more clothes when I make the videos. I'm like, oh, I better put on some underwear if I'm going to make a video. Yeah. I mean, it's hot and humid over there, right? I mean, I get it. I just it. like the, you know, the freedom. You just want the freedom. You're just a free-loving, yes. But that does bring up a good point. We used to do an experiment where we would have the students wash their hands. And oh, they would do, like, the take. Petri. Yeah, you've probably yeah. done it, right? Yeah. Your hand literally sloughs off more dead skin cells and bacteria oh, yeah. after you've washed them. That's why, like you were saying, those, uh, those surgeons wash multiple times for like oh, yeah. two three minutes right no dude. they literally no, 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 want to no. scrub. They scrub with chlorhexidine multiple chlorhexidine mm. scrub pads for like 20 minutes exactly. it's so long the first time i scrubbed in for a surgery i was like oh i'm so glad i i decided against becoming a surgeon i don't know how these guys do this it's yeah. they got that's why they got to pay them a million dollars a year it is the most tedious, exhausting process. They're just scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing every nail, every... Mm. Yeah, man, they're scrubbing. And it's it's not soap and water. It's chlorhexidine, like a some special... It's serious shit. It will kill every living thing on the surface of that guy's skin. And then they put... They double glove for the whole surgery. Yeah, well, that it's if you're spraying your like on the average, I spray my hands on a on a culture day a hundred times easily with alcohol. So when you spray your hands with seventy percent alcohol a hundred times, what does that do to your skin? You turn into an alligator. Yeah. Like you, you, it just wrecks your skin. And then if you do have to touch somebody who has more sensitive friend, like. I'm sorry again. I'm gonna get a little gross, but like if you've got cracky ass, like ashy hands, and you go to like rub a woman's breast she's not gonna like it she's really not gonna like it i like how I, like, this is all relating <laughs> back to sex tonight well we, you we mentioned talking, bangkok i like bangkok. we talked about sterile technique and it's we, we're going to stds we're going to bitter dicks double I dipping mean, double swabbing yes ghetto like swabbing i watched too much jerry springer reruns yeah i don't know what tv you guys got over there uh it's all the same crap it's like soap operas and like yeah. weird cr stupid crime drama it's all the same crap it's just a different language yeah like right now th so this is why the internet will go probably go to shit in about 30 minutes because everybody will be on their lunch hour like checking the soap operas like oh what kind of drama is like who you know they slappy people they can still show like violence on tv here mm -hmm. They can't show guns. If they have a gun or a whiskey bottle, they have to like blur it out or Wait, somebody what? smoking. Yeah, it's so weird. Like they have they'll to be blur that out. Yes, at a bar or something, there'll be like an obvious like whiskey bottle or beer bottle on the table. They have to blur that. It, I think it's mostly for the advertisers. But oh, uh, okay. you know, like at the Bud, they couldn't show like Budweiser at the World Cup because they, they, wow. I don't know, something like that because it was in like Abu Dhabi or wherever Dubai Abu or something. Dhabi, yeah. Yeah, and um, it's like that, but they can actively show women and men. Like, like I was at immigration about six months ago, and on the TV at the immigration, they had a, a woman getting raped. <laughs> like, full on, like, 12 o'clock in the afternoon, a woman on the soap opera, like, getting, like, slapped up and, like, raped. <laughs> and then, like, a scene later, they were, like, drinking in a bar, and they had all, like, the whiskey bottles, like, blared out. It's weird, wow. different moral compasses they have, like... Yeah. Domestic violence is sure. is okay, but you can't show like alcohol. <laughs> or you could show people getting shot, but you can't show the gun. Like right. it's a little bit different. But... Hey, there's a lot of ways to human. And yeah, uh, yep. it's, it's, it's all it's coming back to. We're all so, basically the same. So, um, gloves. 
because <laughs> viruses. So what, what? tell us a little bit about viruses, not human acquired uh. viruses, not <laughs> STD viruses. And I you don't, don't even have to quote a specific virus, but you were telling us about the idea that the fungi can get infected by virus and that you think that mm-hmm. actually might explain some of the stuff that we see in our grows. Talk a little bit about that. For sure. I noticed you guys were talking about stargazer. I don't remember where I got my stargazer swabs from, um, but uh, I gosh, I can't remember. But when the first couple grows, they were all growing squats. And mm-hmm. I was like, what is going on? And I thought maybe it was just some bacterial thing, but they, it was like a whole like tray. I was growing in trays then. And, and then I did some shoe boxes and they were all squats for like three or four grows. And then I cloned a fruit. And then I put that probably through two transfers, and then all of a sudden they popped out like six, eight mm. inch tall fruits. And I was like, what the heck? Because the uh, it was obviously a fruiting culture. And I think what I did was like they do in the cannabis industry. I had isolated a virus free strain, uh, uh, culture. Ah. So what they do with meristematic tissue culture in the cannabis industry, because cannabis has lots and lots of viruses also, and these land races that people have been running for years and years and years, all you do, you know, when you take a clone, you use the same scissors, you know, not these obviously, but you clip that clone off of the mother plant, and then you make a thousand of those, and all of those new clones have the virus, and you do that again and again, and even just standard cultivation you know your your hands are dirty i don't imagine back in the day you know tom with his his little farm in the garage was using gloves now if you watch like a an episode like a youtube series like can of cribs everybody's wearing gloves so this this is the thing and i don't feel like such a i hate to say it like a pussy for wearing gloves because if you work in a cannabis industry and you see people even trimming like those buds that you're buying at the dispensary, do you want some dirty ass hippie trimming those up with no gloves on? Hell no. I don't. No, you're, you're paying thirty bucks. I don't a even want a showered, a well dressed showered hippie <laughs> touching them. No. I know. He's been scratching his nuts all day, you know, spraying alcohol on. <laughs> Everyone scratches their nuts for you, huh? <laughs> and then he's he he man, it's hot here. It's humid. No, you, you know? don't. You definitely don't. You know, don't. bat yeah. wings. Yes. Is that what people call them, bat wings? <laughs> so, so what do you think viruses are doing to, do you think they're changing morphology? Yes, 100%. They're changing okay. the expression of, they're so what some people loosely call epigenetics. Yeah, okay. So what viruses do, like, I, I, again, so uh, an obvious example, herpes. Mm-hmm. Like herpes is a virus that you have your entire life, but you don't always have cold sores. So right. when environmental conditions are right, you will get a cold sore. So when I had that first stargazer, maybe my, my substrate was a bit moist. So again, like, you know, like people like Dave talk about all the time, the, the, the mushroom wants to survive. You know, the same reason you get pins at the edge of the plate or where you've cut a transfer from. The mushroom is like, oh, crap, I need to make a fruit body and I want to make right. spores. So similarly, when when you get a virus or a fungus gets a virus, the time for them to basically spread themselves is when there's intimate contact, the, the sexual reproductive cycle. Just the, right. that's the way, you know, human viruses, most of them spread through contact. When do you have the most contact? Right. When you're like trying to mate with each other. Mm-hmm. So when a mushroom is f- being forced into this condition where it's got to make a fruit body, like it's in an anaerobic, too moist con- container, like Nikki was saying with the pans, you basically what we're doing is we're forcing these fungus into reproducing. Right. And the reason why those viruses get expressed is is because they're under stress. Yep. Just like you get a cold sore, you know, you got a big job interview, and like three days before the oh, job you're interview, hundred percent right about cold that. sore yes. pops up. It's the same exact thing. We, ju- you know, we just have to think about these things in the right context. The more I get experience, and the more I listen to people, even inexperienced people, they they say things, and you listen to them, and you're like, oh my god. Like, I just figured something out yeah. because that person looks at this in a different way. Like yep. when I watch a cannabis video or this woman that does all these variegated plants, you know, these variegated plants, they sell them here for five bucks. You ship them off to England or America, get them through customs and all that, and you sell them for 200. Yep. 
Well, the problem is all of those plants, the reason why they have these variegations on them is from viruses. Wow. It goes, it goes way back to the guy. I used to take a plant pathology class. The guy who, run, who ran the lab, he would not let smokers into his lab because they smoke cigarettes cigarettes have tobacco there's a virus called tobacco mosaic virus oh, that mosaic gets on virus, yeah yeah to make they call it tobacco because it's in the solanaceae so it gets on potatoes tomatoes tobacco chili peppers they're all in the solanaceae plant family wow. and if you smoke cigarettes i mean not like a marble because it's been so processed and whatever right. but if you're smoking like american spirits and you smoke a cigarette and then you go touch a tobacco or a tomato or a potato plant, uh, you're going to infect them with the virus. No doubt. hundred wow. percent. And people like us, I think it's going to get to the point in the next year or two. We don't need CRISPR. We don't need more, you know, penis envy crosses. We need to figure out how to utilize and maybe I'm giving too much away now, but we need to like, if I still had that stargazer, you know what I would do is I would take that thing and clone it. And then I would maybe even try to transmit that virus to another cultigen. Because let's mm. say I got a tall, giant red boy or JMF, big old fruit, and I want to make a squat. And I'm starting to think now, you know, some of the squats, like the KSSS and some of the other squats, those might be cultigens that are expressing viruses when it's time to fruit. Because a lot of them take a long time to fruit, right? And that's because they're messed up. They're messed up. And it could just be that virus in there that's having a, a detriment on the normal metabolic function of the fungus. So it doesn't pop up like a normal, you right. know, after two weeks it pins. They'll sit there for a month and they don't do anything. And then all of a sudden, maybe that virus is like, okay, time to stop being such a jerk <laughs> and let yeah. this thing fruit. And when it fruits, I'll just hitchhike on the back of those spores maybe or that tissue yeah yeah because if this thing if i don't let it like viruses don't want to kill their host right, right. of course they not. that's that's detrimental to their survival so but they do want their host to propagate themselves yeah. and they need the host so if it's a mushroom virus if you kind of think about it, it might be the same thing like maybe this host it's possible yeah, I think it's, it's definitely very, very possible. possible. We're gonna start if, running PCR viral testing on on all our fruits here shortly to figure. Oh, it'll out. come up. I 100%. It'll be positive. I Here's bet. the problem. I have looked into the mushroom virus situation, and they don't have proper names for them. There's one they call something like the French virus on agaricus. Uh, mm -hmm. It's one of the. It looks like a bacterial blotch, but it's the same kind of thing where the mushrooms will reproduce, but they just look really ugly. Right. You know, like us with a cold sore. <laughs> so you can probably still reproduce and you can <laughs> and you can transmit that virus. But, you know, you're still going to be ugly. But it doesn't matter. The virus doesn't care. Virus an doesn't ugly host. Care. Yeah. An ugly host works just as good as a, <laughs> a pretty host. <laughs> that is not a, a determining factor for a virus. No, I like it could that. care less. <laughs> So, yeah, we'll, we'll get on that later on. But um, right now, I'm just trying to figure out the tents and tubs. Oh, I started doing bags. And this is another thing. Like, we're talking about sterility. A lot of people, I, I if, if they don't have environmental concerns, bags maybe are a very good way to oh, yeah. start. The bags. Because you don't have to touch it. There's no exposure to the air. Everything's in the bag. And if you don't have a problem with, you know, spending a buck on a bag or whatever... Here I can get them for like thirty cents, so I'm like I, I have like I mean you 30, so thirty bags. I, I love up. a good unicorn bag, but uh, speaking mm -hmm. of white beard, he you can buy the gallon Ziploc bags and you can grow in those. It tr I mean you got yep. options. It, it doesn't exactly. it, cost shouldn't be keeping you from trying to to grow in bags. For me, what I noticed because I just went back to running a lot more tubs, um, I'm noticing that. Uh, absolutely harder to dial in a modified tub i thought i was dialed in before but i've changed a few things um from my earlier growing techniques and so then i i was like oh i gotta actually revert back to some of my old ways if i want to go back to these old tubs because some of the new things i'm doing isn't isn't working quite quite as well i gotta run my sub a little bit wetter and 
stuff like that. But bags are foolproof, man. I don't care what anybody says. Minus getting a, maybe a little bit more trichoderma um, out of the gate if you're not sterilizing your substrate and uh, a couple other things. Uh, at the end of the day, a lot of people love bags just because you, you can truly leave them be. You will get fruit. Yeah, and to be fair, they're cleaner will. too. You know, yeah. if you're in a if you're in a carpeted like apartment or maybe even a dorm room, you, like mono tubs, they get messy, and you got to wash them. You know, those sixty quart oh ones. Oh the worst. Yeah, yeah, you, it's easier to wash a baby, you know, than wash one of those damn things out. And speaking of like, you know, as you maybe like us, you get a little bit older, man. If you pick up that, you know, if you pick up three mono tubs and you twist your back the wrong way. Yeah. That's like the end of your work day. And I'm still like, I broke my ribs last year and I can't really like pick up three mono tubs anymore. Yeah. And like I said, the ones on the top, the ones on the bottom. So you just got to dial it in. I mean, that's like somebody was asking me, I, I almost have to laugh or chuckle when people are like, how do I grow in a mono tub or something like that? It's like, well, how many days do you have for me to explain <laughs> to you? Right. Like what? Like I don't, I I don't know what to say. Sometimes it's just do it. Dude, when Nikki tonight said the thing about I only answer questions related to the step you're currently on, <laughs> yeah. I was like, and then a few people were like, "Oh, that's gatekeeping." No, it's not. It's no. <laughs> I'm a human being. Uh, do you know how much of myself I give to the community yes. on a regular basis, dude? When Whitebeard was like, my biggest mm. pet peeve about ethics in this community is. When people ask for my time and then ignore all the yeah. advice that they ask for, dude, there's nothing wrong with making that statement. That is, I mean, <laughs> anyway. it, no, at, yeah. not at all. And when you, I mean, again, we, I think we all at this point in our experience level understand that there's a balance. You yeah. really, really want to help every newbie you can. You do. But if it's somebody, it's like a 50 year old housewife who's never like, you know, like touched a scalpel or doesn't know, or like is afraid of an alcohol burner. Like, I'm not really sure sometimes where to like, people are too sensitive. Okay. Let's just be honest. People need to like be a little bit more like manly about it. Like that you, you can't go. I'm sorry. I'll say it. If Nikki and other people, if you're not going to, if you're going to ask people for advice and not take it, then you have to accept the fact that they're probably not going to want to give you advice again. Right, right. And you're also messing it up for other people because you've yes. got that person triggered already. So if you're unfortunately maybe the seventh person of the day that says, how do I grow in a mono tub or what's your recipe for substrate? And, you know, you get a response that such as says CV or QAR or CVG and you think that's rude. Well, you got to remember that, you know, you're asking the same question. That, like I said, I know it's rude, but that's what the search bar is for, literally. I mean, come on. Like, I don't know if people are that lazy. I've got... Oh, they I've are, got dude. My... Dude, at work, I have people call. I work in an emergency room. Like, I literally resuscitate dead people. I have septic people that I have to administer medications in a certain amount of time or they might die. Um, sure, we get stupid stuff in there too, but like I'm a medical professional. I have things to do. They'll call me on the phone. Is this the ER? Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. I was trying to get a hold of the such and such. Do you have the number for that? I'm taking care of five people right now. One of them might die. No, I am not going to be a phone book for you. That's what yeah, that people might... do. <laughs> yeah, next time that might be your grandma sitting right. there bleeding to death and you want me to look up a number for you. Oh, they do though. They you know, uh... even when I triage they're that way. Why would you take him first? Cuz he's a, he's about to die. That's why I took him first. And you cut your finger slicing vegetables tonight. That's why I didn't yeah. take you. Yeah. So, so you got But but look, this is all good it. stuff to talk about. It doesn't get talked about, you know, um I know so many people in my Discord who spend hours and hours every single day helping people, freely sharing information that they are not gatekeeping, that they are not trying to monetize. Um, yeah. And uh, I have people like, uh, I'm going to shout out Vegas Mandy. She came in as a newbie. She's killing it. Why is she killing it? Because <laughs> she just did the things people told her to do and so her learning was accelerated more rapidly and 
yeah, I got other people that they come in and man, in three to six months, you can be pretty good if you just listen to the mm. right people and then pay attention yeah. to what you're doing. Like I said, find a guru, like, you know, slightly feral or whoever it might be. Find whoever. a guru yeah. and stick with that person. Yeah, maybe. I don't want to like he's going to yeah. inbox going to blow up now. Uh, just find somebody, look through the messages and find somebody who obviously knows what they're talking about. Right. But also the, the I, it's frustrating, I think, also when, like, you try to take somebody under your wing and they, they kind of are constantly double checking, like, on Reddit. I get people that'll be like coming at me with all this crap they read on like Reddit or whatever, and I'm like, I, I thought it was like you should, do you do not did you not realize that's not a valuable source of information for most things? So instead of listening to me who's got 30 years of experience, you're gonna go listen to some like 17 year old kid right. who just got his like first spore syringe and be like, well he said you should do this, and I'm like, well right. listen to them. Like, I'm not going to argue with you over something somebody said on Reddit. Like, I'm sorry. That's not worth right. my time. And it, it, I don't know. People on both sides, right? We get sensitive about it. They get sensitive about it. And then you got somebody doxing you because you're, you know, right. you didn't get their fucking spore syringe in, in the mail in time or whatever. Right. It's like, oh, man. It's a little bit fr frustrating. But deep breath. Deep breath. Yeah. <sighs> what, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Um, you're just going to either keep growing mushrooms or you're going to quit growing mushrooms. That's it. You and just and, and so all I'm about, everything I'm about, everything I talk about is how can we cultivate a community that we want to be in, that nourishes and nurtures us, that is mm. fun and enjoyable to be in, and... Uh, so that we grow we're all cultivators so mm. we grow our community the larger our community is the more people that stay in our community the larger our lobby will be the larger uh, a faction we will be the larger group we will be able to advocate for what we believe in and what we know to be true about mushroom medicine we should not, everybody that leaves because somebody was an asshole to them, I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how much you figured out. If you can't be nice to somebody, just shut the fuck up. Yeah, that's exactly. Right? Yeah. So, some that's all you got to do. Go be, like a dick to, go be a dick to somebody else. Go be a dick to a human being you actually know in real life. Right, yeah, where there's some risk. consequences to it. Yeah, exactly. Right, that's it. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that like like saying that that those are probably the same people that are gonna kick their dog and like beat their wife. And it's like, yeah, you're just a piece of shit. Like probably a lot a of people of are just generally. I mean, some piece people shit. no, some people are just. Uh, it's the <laughs> internet. There's no mm. fucking consequence to it, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're just. Dude, I remember this is way back before. This is when it was called the World Wide Web. Yeah. This was yep, when yep. I plugged my modem, my phone into a modem. This was like pre 2400 baud. This was way back. And I would be on these little, I forget if they're called BBSs or these little chat groups uh, or whatever. Bullet, yeah, bulletin board things. Yeah, yeah, bulletin board type thing. And I had some guy that was like, I'm going to come kick your ass and da 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 And so I gave that motherfucker my address. He was like, oh, I'm in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm going to come. I'm like, oh, bitch, I'll give you my fucking address. So he shows up at my house. I come to the door and wow. I go, I go, holy shit, you showed up. I go, you ready to kick my ass now? And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. Motherfucker was not going to kick my ass anyway. But. I was like, you did you really just drive? We ended up talking, and it was all so stupid. But I was like, oh. why the fuck did you? You now he's, really now he's like came your best to friend. my house? <laughs> oh, no, we're definitely not best friends. I never <laughs> talked to the guy ever again in my life. But, like, I couldn't believe that dude came to my house. There's, there's people that are very mentally disturbed out there. That Like, I watch too many of those crime documentaries. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. Uh, there's there are people out there that are uh, on oh, the yeah. edge. Uh, they're very very much on the edge. Yeah, there are sociopaths. 
you work everybody probably works with at least one they don't care about anybody they're sociopathic there are yeah there are people that are just one bad event away from becoming homicidal fucking maniacs you just don't know yeah that's why I, that. I try to be nice to everybody unless somebody really gives me a reason to not be you know not be and it doesn't even matter. Still got somebody hating on you all that's the time. Why, that's why I only cut off people in my motorcycle if I can get to the very, very front and make like a turn before they can come up behind me with the axe. Yes. <laughs> like I make sure can. you have a, a getaway. Yeah. <laughs> Yo. I can drive the wrong way on the so opposite side of the road to like get away. They can't do that with like a truck, but my no. motorcycle, I can do that. Yes. No, man, my, uh, probably the first three months in LA, I used to live in Los Angeles, California, and uh, first three months, somewhere around there, very early, just moved there, um, watched some guy cut another guy off, I'm like a few cars back uh, in, in the lane about to turn left, and uh, the one guy gets out and just blows up at the guy who cut him off, and, uh, and they yell a little bit, and then the guy kind of goes back to his car, and uh, the guy who just got yelled at just calmly gets out of his car. And or, I'm sorry, he was like about to sit down and he's like, no, I'm going to go back to my car. Pop, oh, no, I'm sorry, he popped his trunk. And then uh, pulls a fucking bat out of his trunk and proceeds to start bashing up the guy's car who yelled at him. And I was like, okay, in Los Angeles, I will not be doing any more road rage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's... Like, you don't know, man. Uh, I know. Even in San Francisco, my friend, he used to work in San Francisco, and he carried a, a freaking Glock with him on the seat because he had to drive over to Oakland every day. <laughs> right. And he's, like, up in Oakland, like, waving his nine around at, wow. like, people on the highway. I'm like, dude, are you insane? You're going to get shot. Yeah. You're, like, driving a nice car, like a white boy driving a nice car in Oakland waving a gun. I'm like, are you suicidal? Like, you are going to get shot, like, for sure, 100%, you will get shot. I don't know, yeah. like, what? But on uh, both sides, he was a little bit mental, too, you know? And it was like, okay, this is the kind of people who might be in the other cars. Like like you said, it puts you in, like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, like, wow, I know people like that. And I consider them my friends. Like, what if, what if like, what about the right. other people who aren't my friends that don't know me? Uh, but. Yeah, we want to. Oh, dude! Before we get, we could go on for hours. I know, but we want to talk about that dragon. What is it called? The grab and drag? Is that what people are calling? Yes, it? we should talk about that. So, guys, um, we're definitely on a mission to. Uh, you know, we've just noticed an increased interest in doing crosses. You know, crossing two uh, cultigens and seeing what you get. Um, a lot of people have been doing this using ghetto swabbing and um, smash cross or ghetto, yeah, ghetto cross and smash cross methods. Uh, a few thing. other, you know, the historic uh, snake venom, all these oh. things that we've heard. Oh, about. that reminds me, I got to order my snake venom. Shit. You're oh. running out. Act <laughs> now. You can get three vials for the price of one. Oh, um, great. There's really easy way to, ways to do it. When I first came into to the community, um, it, I think pretty early on, even guys like uh, Gary Hefferly were doing uh, serial dilution tech videos and talking about you know how to isolate spores or how to dilute a solution of spores to the point where when you spread it out onto a Petri dish, a few different ways to do that. Um, that you might be inclined to just have a single spore germinate and start to grow hyphae, and then you could isolate that monocarion, which is just a haploid. It's one of the two uh, required nuclei to create, to go through. Anyway, I'm not going to do the whole uh, karyogamy and all that stuff, but in order to ultimately make fruit, it has to be a dicarion. So... That method is not too bad. Ed's got some videos on how to do a ghetto dilution method. Uh, mm -hmm. Dave Wombat has talked about how you can just suck up some spores in a syringe, and he uses a syringe dilution method. It's pretty simple. But there is an even simpler way. Ed ha kind of happened, I'm assuming he happened upon this, his technique for just 
taking uh, swabs and germinating them on plates, his technique has managed to also successfully and readily isolate monokaryons. Uh, you know, why don't you just talk those... a little bit about like where the idea came from or if somebody told it to you and then just talk about the concept behind it, like why it works, why it's, in my opinion, it's the best way to germinate spores I've tried to date. Yeah, I've had like uh, probably 15 or 20 people like sending me personal messages like, oh my gosh, this has like changed my life. Kind 100%. Of shit. I'm, like, dude. I'm like, whoa, yeah. like. So that's one of those chant. I don't. I forgot who the original quote is, but like the chance favors a prepared mind kind of thing. Okay. I basically had a swab, and I was like, you know what? There's not very many spores on here, and I really want to get them into the auger or agar, but I don't want to just ram because it was a it was an older swab, and I thought, you know, there's like probably ten thousand swabs on uh, spores on this swab. Right. And I want to get the best possibility of just getting two of them to germinate. I just wanted a dicarion. Okay. And I did that. And when I did that, as expected, not many things germinated. And I did the serpentine <coughs> thing primarily to save plates because, I, I, you know, sometimes you're on your last plate or two. Right. And so I'm like, well, I want to get this on agar. I want to, like, make sure every spore on here has the potential to germinate. And I just did that serpentine thing. And about four or five days later, I had three or four colonies, and I checked them, and I was like, oh, they're not monocarion, or they're not dicarion. So I was a little bit disappointed. And then I looked at them, I'm like, wait a minute, I just accidentally made monocarions. Like, I had four little colonies, and I was like, oh my gosh, like, these aren't contaminants, these are actual spores. And then I realized, like, okay, if I subculture these, I have monocaryons, and done. then I thought, again, that chance favored the prepared mind, or maybe just I'm a freaking moron. I'm like, I could put two monocaryons together and make a dicarion. Right. <laughs> so what I did was I isolated all the monos, and then on another plate, since I had poured more plates, I took all four of those monos and mashed them together and got a dicarion from them. Does that sound yeah, familiar? Know. So basically, I mated the the thing with itself to right. get a dicarion. So I made my four monos, and I got a dicarion, and I fruited that, and then it's like that. Like as they said, what did they say? It's all downhill from there. It's that was like some of the a first slippery slope. Yeah. yeah, slippery slope. And I'm like, wait a minute. Instead of just taking a swab and mashing it into a plate. Why don't I just do this and I can get monos, dicarions? And I, I wish I would have emphasized it a little more in that video, but I think you went over it a bit last week when you did the, we showed the, the toke, right? Uh, the mm -hmm. plate. Is that how you say it? Toke. Toke, yeah. Okay. Like, okay. I so. just took a toke. That's what I thought. And then somebody else corrected the original person who, did, yeah, big mess, but okay. So yeah, like that, exactly like that. And I was like, oh my gosh, you can like kill three birds with one stone here. Like you get a dicarion, you, you, the other thing is you're checking for contamination. Mm -hmm. If you get a contaminated swab and that's what they do in bacteriology, if you want to isolate. So again, I bring it in my microbiological experience and there's a little bit I know about cannabis and a little bit I know about mammalian tissue culture. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is exactly what they do in microbiology. When they want to yeah. identify bacteria, they streak them out in a slightly different version or they do a serial dilution and then they pick individual colonies right except for us it's monocaryons so it's exactly the same thing so strangely enough i end up watching a lot of these videos on other topics like plant tissue culture you know when you go onto a wikipedia page and then 20 windows later right because yes. you're like open that hyperlink in a new tab new tab new tab and at like three in the morning you're like wow i got like 40 tabs i need to read like i'm gonna just close down the computer and start again tomorrow <laughs> well that's kind of like every reference yes right. well that's like monos you're like oh i got three monos and now i like so if you do the math i haven't figured out the equation but if you do like say one with two one with three and then you do like two with three 
And then when you get a fourth mono, you do one with two and one with three and one with four and two with four and two with three and two with four. And it gets really, really. So Gary was talking about doing monos in 96 well plates. When I heard that, I literally started laughing. I'm like, oh, my God, Gary's insane. Gary is (laughs) fucking batshit crazy. Like, he is no fucking... Does he realize? I was just sitting there like, Gary, 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 you poor man. You poor, poor soul. I'm like, I there think is no... We all, we all experience that. <laughs> I mean, oh dude, God. you... I think we, like, in a matter of two weeks, it was like, is Anna has, like, 14th Nat yes. Cross already? Like, what the... When you do yeah. the math, I've got... The That's all. It's statistical now. probability, dude. It doesn't take long for those numbers to just yeah. exponentially go up. And well, so we if you start... get like now, I've got like like uh like Nikki was talking about building up his mono collection. So now let's just say I've got ten monos. I've probably got about fifteen. So if I've got ten that I've already mated, I got a new iceberg mono. That's what I'm gonna do later today. It's my daytime. Later today, I'm gonna take the ten monos that I have and mate them all with the iceberg. So that's of course you're ten. Gonna. You have that's to. That's ten more crosses. Right. That's like the F1 cross. So that doesn't count the F2 and the F3. Yeah, right. And so if I get another, I also yesterday I did the the ghetto dilution with the little water vials mm-hmm. and the shake shake shake. No tween. I just did it straight up tap okay. water. It worked perfect with that. I did it with the iceberg monos too. Uh, I did BHT yesterday and, and a Chodamak, Chodamak, whatever Choda. Okay however the hell they say it um and so now probably today i'm gonna, or maybe tomorrow i'm gonna have another chota mono and another um bht mono so all of those 10 plus the iceberg so that's another right. 11 and then 12 another crosses so within like three or four days i'm gonna make like 35 more crosses of course and i'm are. really starting you need to, to start think, you need oh, to buy the little God. 60 millimeter plates dude <laughs> No, I don't. Those are awkward for me. You said like the tactile thing. Like I can't work it's with the small. sixty mil. Yeah. They're too small. Way too I small. I like the ninety and. Yeah. Uh, um. Like, so I got an so idea. A <clears throat> uh, couple people have mentioned this. I'm. I'm gonna. If you want to tell a story about venereal diseases or something, I'm. I'm gonna <laughs> grab a few things and just quickly show. Unless you happen to have something handy, but I have something pretty handy. Um, I can a tell couple- a story. Sorry about a couple dog, people just wanted surgery. to see the technique. And, oh, yeah. And so, so I'll demonstrate it, and then you can critique me, tell me if, if you like my technique or not. I actually like show and tell. I, I set up a little lab demonstration, you oh, guys. You have I have it. my. Oh, perfect. No, but I, I have my, my kit that I use for. I, I'll talk about scalpels while you go get your. Okay, thing. cool. All right. Okay, you guys, I want to give you a little bit of a... He's going to show you basically what he's done, and I want to show you the the kit that you need to do it. You need a really, really... Sh- oh, this is not... Maybe I'll put it in the back of my hair. I wish I had a darker background. You need a really, really fine point tweezers. Um, you can get these in the cosmetic aisle. They're, I guess they use them for plucking eyebrows or something like that. Um, they're really, really cheap. I've got some fancy ones that I just touched and are all sticky. Um, something like this where, uh, yeah, they put a little sticker on them. Something like this. This one's got a little slider. You need something that you can, that's metal that you can burn. So alcohol or you stick in your induction heater. You need like a really sharp pointy ended tweezers. Um, mine's got a little fancy slider on there. It's, it's kind of a little bit too much, but sharp pointed tweezers. Another nice tool that, um, uh, you'll probably run across is, is scalpel blades, obviously. Uh, or handles, I should say. You've got number four. This is, uh, I don't use these anymore. These are a, a bigger sort of attachment at the end. Then you have your number three scalpel handle, which has a smaller little attachment there. And then you have what's called a number seven. Sevens, what's up, bro? Yeah, you guys, this is the it's bomb right here. That's what you want. You notice how far away you can hold the handle? So like we were saying, if you if you aren't going to wear gloves, you get in there with like a number three or number four blade. You see, look how close your hand is to you're that plate. You're all over that plate. You're yeah, you're literally over. right on. These are for surgery where you need to maybe push down and cut through tissue. We're cutting through agar plates. We don't need to like <laughs> dig down in, right? That'd be like you stab somebody in prison. That's like a shiv, you know? It's like, a, eh, a eh, shiv, eh, dude. Bone check, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is like basically, this is what microbiologists use. Like a number seven and a number eleven. If you'll if you'll see there at the end, the blade's quite a bit smaller. 
and you see how pointy it is there you can really really get in there so if you're picking monos you cannot do that with a bigger blade i don't want to open one up but you need something like this to pick monos or if you want to go all old school get a sewing needle like an old sewing needle that, mm. again, you buy at the dollar store. Get a sewing needle, and you can actually bash the end of it down so it's got almost like a little scoop, and oh, you can use some. that. Yeah, I don't have one sitting here, but you can kind of – you just got to go to the cosmetics aisle and look around. Or or if you're in a pinch and you need like a scoopy-doopy thing, you just like bend over the end of that number 11 scalpel blade. They have other sizes, and I'd go with the straight shooters also. They have curved ones. They got all those different numbers, like number 14, 15, the curved thing. Number all that 11. Stuff. Number, number 11, 11 you guys, That's straight up. up. The other thing is it cools down. The reason why real microbiologists and maybe even surgeons would use these is because they cool down and heat up quickly. So if you were going to sterilize it with either heat, a flame, induction cooker, or even alcohol induction heater, not a cooker, um, if you want to burn that, it'll cool off or, or heat up and cool off very, very quickly. Um, be careful. They are sharp as hell. This is a brand new one almost. But you can see I've burned it a lot of sharp. time. Yes. Yeah, they literally are razor sharp. They're for surgery. Um, yeah, so if so, you're, like, mm, scared of knives, be careful. Because if you drop this on your foot, it will go, like, straight through your foot. <laughs> I use this guy. This is so handy. I'm going to buy a uh, bunch and sell them for dirt yeah. cheap on my Etsy. Um, I'm only going to do it as like an add-on because I don't want to have to sit around and ship little packages all day. But <laughs> yeah, this thing, I, I use this literally every day. It's just yep. a simple bent needle. It's great. All right, so the... the um, Did Wancho tell you how to do that? That, that was his little trick. Juan, Juan. Uh -oh. Mr. Mr. J. What? But you mean this? <laughs> he uses this? He's does it very, very similar to that. Yeah, oh, I remember cool. back. And dental picks. You know, some people use dental picks. Oh, those yeah. weird. Yeah, like, there's, like you just got to get creative, you know, and, yeah. and whatever's comfortable in your hand. Remember, these are yeah. things you're going to use thousands of times in your yeah. hobby. So, like, just get, like, if a scalpel handle costs you, like, 10 bucks, just buy it. Oh, <laughs> like, that, the number buy, seven, like, you can get them for under $10. On, yeah, on and they'll, they'll last forever. Yeah. They're stainless steel. They're metal. Yep. They're, they'll last forever. <laughs> so I actually have my swabs. They kind of have, I don't know if Spray my do. hand with alcohol. I'm not going to because I'm not working with actually any <laughs> I just, cultures. oh, I touched something sticky. I One of the, the things had a sticker on it. All right. So let me try to do this. So you basically take a tuft. So I have these razor sharp. I saw these little, these are, um, carbon steel um so they work in my sterilizer but anyway the the very oh, fine yeah. point so i just kind of get down in here let me see if i can do this holding it way out in front of me i get down sorry i gotta look at it and then you it's just kind of get kind of get it in there and then you're just pulling a tuft of that off yeah so you're getting a very small tuft from a swab. Now, of course, this was a clean swab. It has no spores on it. Um, but a small piece of this on an actual spore swab would have tens of thousands, hundreds, of if not thousands and thousands of spores. But at yeah. a minimum, it will have hundreds of spores. Oh, easily. So then you take your Petri dish. How can I do this? So, okay. This is going to be very weird to do, not looking at it or doing it backwards. But you you jab it in. So I've literally stabbed that swab into the plate, or that little tuft of swab into the plate. And then you're just dragging it. And this is yeah. now, this is where it's going to get real weird to do backwards. But you're... Don't, don't let go. Keep it in the tweezers. Yes. So this is, God, that I can do this backwards is... I know, I'm dude. I got... myself. So do you that's see I'm just dragging like... it? Yep. That's and I'm, I'm never pulling off. And then now the part I'm going to get wrong, but don't, you know, don't get mad. <laughs> but at the end, and the, even on Ed's video, this is a, this is a problem part. But I got I, it perfect that one time and the most three out of four times it doesn't work. So what I have to do, this is why I showed you this thing. I actually yeah. use this thing to jam that little tuft in so it can pull out. So then you have, it looks really ridiculous. 
God dang it. <laughs> See, you drop things did, like me. I did an ad, guys. Did you do that on purpose? You no, did that on I purpose? Did, I did not. That's just. That's my trademark, man. <laughs> that is your trademark. So that's all it is right there. Um, I just did a. I, so I grew this like massive ODPE fruit. It was like 160 grams. Um, so I took spores of that and I just germinated that. So this one has a bunch more. I actually did a couple. Sometimes my agar, if it's not thick enough or fresh enough, it'll get caught and then it'll kind of rip off. Yeah, so I have to redo matter. it. But but yeah, it this was a matter. this was a great example. It's you're, you're just snaking it through like this. And what happens is spores fall off and they get stuck in the crack and it germinates rapidly, often in two days for me. Mm. Yeah, I was surprised if you got fresh spores when the iceberg, when oh, yeah. I did it with the iceberg, I did I did also the ghetto dilution as well as what you just did, mm -hmm. the, the grab and drag. And uh, I was like kind of shocked. I'm like, oh my gosh, maybe I got clones because they were so fresh. And within three days, I it was up three days, and then by four days, I picked them. I'm like, they're all going to be dicarions because I right. thought maybe I'd got tissue from the swab. And I was like, I looked under the scope and I saw just spores, and no, they were all monocarions. Yeah. Every single that's what it's surprising when you get your first mono. You're like, oh my gosh, that was so easy. Yeah, you're but like, I cannot it, believe it's, that. it's brilliant. And your little quote about the prepared mind is whatever gonna figure shit yeah, out. I than the yeah, I forget. Yeah, something mind. like that. But it yeah. works because you just have you're taking a small bit of it, and it's being smeared through, right? It's being like pressed mm. in through, and just little spores are smearing off. That's dropping it. off and they're in a it's just like why side pins work right side pins work because there's that little crack with a perfect microclimate mm. so it's just taken off well anyway, see that the it's, it's great and and unlike many other techniques where you like put the i know james cruz was talking about he jabs his in and keeps it underneath the agar uh, um, which is great that that will work as well it won't get you monos though like this technique will that's that's what i love about this technique I think that's maybe the big improvement that kind of yeah. like accidentally I discovered. Um, but yeah, like the, the under thing, um, that's good if you've got a contaminated spore swab or any, even you can do it with chunks of agar that are right. contaminated. You want the mycelium to grow through the media. Yeah. But if you're, if you're, if your stuff that contaminated, then, uh, then you probably should maybe just get a better spore swab supplier. Right. <laughs> if you're dealing with really super contaminated swabs, maybe get a new vendor. Yeah, man, uh, I don't know. I <laughs> I never sold swabs because I'm like, I'm new. I don't, you know, I don't want to screw it up. I don't want to start shipping out all these things that everybody's going to say I do wrong. Man, none of my shit is contaminated ever. Ever, I know. ever, 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 ever. I if have you never learned, had it yet. If you learn to do it the right way, and I don't, I don't, again, I don't want to call anybody out, but I keep hearing these people talking about, I want the swabs to be really dark blue and saturated. No. This is not correct thinking, you guys. Like a, a dark blue swab, it's blue because of the bruising from the tissue that the swab has been rammed into. It's a sign Spore. that it's been aggressively swabbed, yeah. You're right. going to get and tissue I, on it. Yes, and bacteria. If yeah. the if the if you okay, so when the first time I swabbed an albino gumby, I think it was, I realized this that oh my gosh, there's it doesn't look like there's any spores on my swab, and I know it's mature. And I looked under the scope, and there were thousands of spores. And then I let that swab sit there that I just ripped off a little piece to look under the microscope, and it started to turn blue. And I'm like, oh my gosh. You know what happens after you swab these translucent spores? The spores are not blue. The spores are translucent. So I had to put this together like I'm swabbing translucent spores. They are not what makes the swab blue. Correct. Right? A dark blue swab does not mean you have more spores. You know what I do sometimes? If you swab a spore print, if you take a spore print, my BHT that I just did, I, I wanted to send off some free, like, you know, extras. So I took a BHT spore print, which is very, very clean. Here's the thing. You can swab a spore print 
You take a sterile, and I just did it, and you can make hundreds of swabs from a good spore print. On a spore print, the spores have dropped. They're mature. They're clean if it's done properly. And you can make hundreds of swabs. That's why a spore print costs 30 bucks or 40 bucks because the vendors know that you can literally take that print and turn around and make 100 or 200 swabs from it. A big and one, sell yeah. Them for, yeah. Yeah, and sell yeah. them for 10 Yeah, that one you – you know, a, yeah. a print this big, you could make 400 swabs off it. Sell them for yep. 10 bucks a piece, man. That's like, you know, putting baby formula in your Colombian right. stuff. You know, like, it's like you just like quadrupled your profit at least. Yeah. Um, and so that's uh, that's another technique. And the, with the grab and drag, if you've got an older spore print that maybe doesn't have as, as many fertile spores on it as it did, you know, a year or two ago, getting them under the surface of the agar, like, like James Moistens does, them up, yeah. get them under there. Yeah. If you, if you, I did this a couple of weeks ago. And again, from experience, I did my little, my little trick where I cut off a piece of the agar and I dipped it on the spore print and then I put it on the plate. Yeah, that's cool. They're, they're kind they're, they're like not really doing much and I'm going to have to either uh -huh. hydrate them or do the, I'm going to have to do that. They're quite old, maybe three or four year old prints. Um, they might need a little extra care. So I'm going to do the, um, the grab and drag thing with a print and, and just get them under. And, and I, here's another strange topic that we talked about maybe like six months ago, this idea that, you know, if you've ever grown tomatoes, if you've grown an heirloom tomato and you keep the seeds, one of the things you have to do is you take a tomato and you take off the seeds and you let them sun dry. Right. And if you don't do that and you don't put them in the fridge or let them, I forget the word they use it, like it's aging, like you got to let them like age. Okay. It's like oh, ripening, I think they call it. Same with cannabis seeds. You have to let them ripen and mature after they've been harvested. Right. If you take a, a fresh tomato and you put it in the ground, even if it's mature, those seeds will not grow. You have to take them out of the tomato and kind of rinse them off and get all these inhibitory things off of the seeds. And it makes perfect sense if you think about it. If you are a tomato plant and your tomato drops down to the ground, you do not want all your seeds growing directly right under the mother yeah. plant, right? It doesn't make any sense. So I've been thinking with the, the grab and drag as well as just cereal dilutions in general, you're trying to get those spores spread out. They right. want to be monocaryons. They want to find another. It's just like any other organism. You don't want to mate with yourself, right? Some the idea do, was, but yes, the idea is not to do it's, that. <laughs> it's not very productive, usually. Yes. I think I do it about once every other night, but um, it's not very. <laughs> as, as he looks at the garbage can, <laughs> make another <laughs> meme about that. <laughs> I mate with myself every other night. Um, <laughs> If the cops need any DNA, it's it's readily available. Um, anyway, uh, tomato seeds, they will not germinate if they're in close proximity to their neighbors. And uh, I think it might be the same thing with spores. You want to give them some, some real estate. You know, you want to get them spread out. And if you happen to pick one of them when they're a monocarian, then all the much better. I mean, they want to be with they want to be with that, you know, I don't know, leukistic Burma or that. Dude, you know, your Tanzanian. little... Um... Your little thing about uh, in the beginning where you just had monos and you just mated monos with itself, so it wasn't really a cross. It was, mm. I don't know. I mean, it's a it's a mon mon not cross, whatever it would be called. Yeah, but It'd just be um, a multi. You could just call it a multi spore, I guess. Yeah, because that, that inevitably that's what a multi spore is. In, the in, dominant yeah. genotype is is going to be if you do BRF cakes, probably one of the genotypes is going to become the fruit. Right. And that might be that there's a whole other idea behind that, too. That might not be what you're looking for. If you're doing multi-spores and the first fruit that pops out is a normal brown cube, that's okay if that's what you yeah. want. But that's not the way to get an albino or some exotic thing. Right. Because the first multi-spore that fruit that's going to pop out is going to be a typical brown B-plus right. right. GT-looking thing. Yeah, but so. doing that, um, you're, uh, you're essentially – on one level verifying that it's another way of a, like another check on your mono status. Oh yeah. Just yeah. Another check. I mean, it mm. does not replace the scope, but so we got a guy in our discord who's just learning. He's trying to hunt and he, it's not an easy thing when you're first doing this. You got to look at a lot of mycelium. You got to look at a lot of hyphae. You got to look at mm. them from a lot of places on the plate 
and you got to get your mounting technique down. There's like so many factors that play into what you're going to ultimately be looking at under the scope. And he, he was struggling to figure out, well, so how do I know if I really have a mono or not? If you have two monos and they mate with each other, then you, you're good. You got mm -hmm. a mono. You never throw away those old. I don't know how many people watch the the video, but I put like seven monos on one plate, right. and you want to do that for two reasons. If you're running out of plates, <laughs> you put a one mono on on every plate, and they if right. they don't grow or they get contaminated or whatever. You, and also it's just a time thing. Put seven of them on one plate, and when you see that they're growing nicely, you might even see the want to get the kind of tomentose ones. Yeah. If you've got a mono and it all of a sudden kicks out a rhizomorph, that's probably not a mono. Not that that's a really great characteristic, but if it kicks out a rhizomorph from what you think your mono little colony is, it's probably not a mono. Yeah. You can move on to the next one. So if you get those, um, say you've got seven monos on a plate, keep that plate even after you've checked them under the microscope and even after you've subcultured them. Because if you do do matings and you look back at you know, mono number one or mono number two and you see a fruit body coming off of that mono, Right. It wasn't a mono. Right. So kind of with the ghetto smashing or the double swabbing, you, you're back to the same. You have to reconfirm that your matings were, in fact, monos. Right. So if I mate like an albino huatla, you know, M1, mono number one with a GT M2, and I look back a month later and that GT's got like a fruit body growing off it, that it's probably like my offspring, my F, you know, my F1 cross is going to be a GT. Right. Yeah. Right. Because again, the dicarans are always going to be more, they're going to be stronger than the monos. So w there's another discussion going on where if you take two monos on a plate and you cross them, oftentimes the dicarian will overlay the monos that yeah. you started off with. And you'll see fruit bodies on both sides where the old mono mycelium was. And you're like, what's going on here? Several people have noticed this and it's a fascinating phenomenon, but the, the first dicarion that forms is almost always going to be the dominant genotype. Right. So if you're doing a multi-spore, you're going to pop out a fruit, and that fruit's going to be a generic-looking brown cube. Almost always. Well, I mean, so it makes sense because if you go, if you think, okay, what does, what does a cubensis look like in the wild? This is ultimately its most dominant, stable genotype. Yeah. And, 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 and the, the phenotype from that. But we have fucked around with these things so much that we're getting all these bizarre, <laughs> unusual expressions, right? Like yeah. every bizarre possibility, just like how dogs over the last probably 50,000 years have been bred to do the same thing and, and have different expressions. We're doing that. But the minute you take once you've really just isolated a single haploid with another single haploid and they mate, they're going to want to express their most dominant traits. It is completely to be expected. It will be boring the first time out. Now then those quadrillion spores that you get from that first fruiting, this is what Ed and I talk about, all those spores can do anything. Yeah. And so F1 is going to look a certain way, but F2, F3, that's where things might start to get interesting. So that's yeah, where, we're... yeah, every, a lot of people are having trouble with a, a, the, the false, I don't want to call it false advertising, but they'll get a cultigen and it doesn't look like it did in the picture. They yeah. see an Instagram picture, and even some of the vendors, they don't use the picture that they – they didn't grow the fruit. Right. So this is like you were saying. One thing about the swabbing and getting into the vendor industry is you have to trust if you're going to outsource swabs or spores, get them from somebody like Dave, like Nikki selling Dave spores. Like I wouldn't worry about that, you know. Right. But if you're getting your B-plus swabs from your buddy who like is on his third grow – and all of a sudden you're like, I'm a vendor now. I'm going to sell B plus. And it's from some dude who's on his third monotub. You're going to probably see, see a lot of variation, contamination or whatever. And if you've got somebody who's got like, I don't know, like a, a you know, albino riptide or whatever, chode wave, and they haven't grown it themselves. It's, it's really kind of sketchy, you know? Yeah. 
like you you're, you're really if you you know it's 10 bucks but but if you're if you're really really expecting I, the some of the guys here they've they've really um dove well into the like i saw this picture on instagram i need to have it right. part of my collection and they um you know they'll fruit it in a mono tub or a bag and they're like it's not what it looks like in the picture and i'm like well <laughs> you paid 10 bucks for it like don't <laughs> it's on it's like f2 or f yeah. you bought it off some vendor on instagram who doesn't like i don't know know what they're doing i'm sorry to say yeah. it, but maybe they don't really know what they're doing yeah i mean the people that that <laughs> i'm sorry if you vend um you they either need to be picks of your own fruit or fruit of people you've sold your own spores or, mm. or genetics to who grew your stuff so then it, it's still yours if you're working backwards and going well i got this from this guy here's his pictures it's not it's not as kosher well that's the transparency thing yeah. I, I feel that like if you haven't grown the fruit with the swabs that you're selling are from you got to be transparent yeah. about if i got this from my friend B billy bob but they're not gonna be yeah yeah People they're are not just gonna not. be somebody up here was like her let me find it if you don't have a picture of the fruit 90 percent of vendors suspicious. right now not growing and not showing pictures of their own shit. Yeah, you're probably right, dude. It's unfortunately... It's a big discussion on one of the other groups now. It's like these people are like, I don't have a picture of the swabs that I'm selling. And I'm like, what the fuck are you selling? Then you... Then, yeah. Don't sell them. For, I'm sorry, for, but that's going to piss yes. some people off. If you didn't grow the fruit and you don't got a picture, even if it's a shitty picture of one fruit that you swabbed, you shouldn't be selling swabs. This is not no. Walmart. If you're Walmart and you're importing shit from China and selling it, that's fine. We knew it came from China. But if you're selling swabs that you didn't grow, I'm sorry. That's like borderline unethical. Well, yeah, oh, and let, that's for sure. Unless they're from like, like Nikki, he's like, these are Dave swabs. Like that's yeah. like, so if you got a problem with it, go keep, go bitch at Dave. Good luck. But like, go, go bitch him out, you know, yeah. uh, like. If, but if you're just selling mystery swabs of, like, GT, like, you should probably have a picture of them. I mean, it's real, to me, it's real simple. So you just sent me some iceberg spores. So, uh, um, I, and I You've got a picture of the fruit that those came from. I have like, your pictures. You literally I could have... be an asshole, and I could just go, here you go, guys, a hundred bucks a set. The yep. only iceberg spores exactly. in existence right you now. You can do that if you want. But that's stupid. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm going to grow them out and see what they look like and take pictures. And I'm just going to give them all away anyway. But, um, like, if all you do, whether you get a, a plate culture or you get a spore culture, liquid culture, whatever, grow it. Don't sell a yes. goddamn thing until you grow it. Then oh, when God, you grow what? it, collect spore prints or spore swabs of that. At that point, you absolutely can sell the prints or the, the swabs because you grew the shit. This and is you crazy. just say, I got this from Ed. Genetics from Ed. Genetics from Miss Mush. Genetics from Nikki Maiko. I just did uh, my first grow of this, and I'm now making prints or swabs available. You do that. You don't clone the liquid culture out and sell it immediately. You have got to grow the shit out. You have got to uh, grow the shit out. These you just do. I, when I heard that people were doing that, I was like dumbfounded. Like, oh my gosh, you mean you got a liquid culture syringe. You put it into a bigger bottle, Expanded and now you're and selling it. that? Yeah, I was. You can't wait three weeks or a month to. I mean, for fuck's sake, if you can't yeah. fruit mushrooms in a month, you shouldn't be selling LC. You should. Not. If you can't fruit a cube in a month, there is no fucking way you deserve to ever be selling shit. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm LC green. swabs. If you if you can't in a month take LC and turn it into a fruit body, don't sell it. Don't sell anything. Yeah. <laughs> Those are if the you're kind not of actually people. growing mushrooms, 
That's the problem. Oh, this blows me away. I, and I, you know, obviously I get excited about this. I've had personal experience here. Guys will be like, oh, this is an ape. This is I, how many Yetis I've been through, supposed right. Yetis. This is a ghost LC. And I paid 25 bucks for it thinking like, oh, man, I got Yeti. You know, this was like a year or two ago. And it's a freaking GT. Other people that are getting like oyster mushroom cultures right. like LC. So not only have they robbed you, you've wasted your time. Yep. Like, I don't want to grow LC that is a freaking oyster mushroom. I don't want to spend my time doing that right yeah and it's, it makes you're, yeah it's just bad it's really see bad. those are the kind of people you might want to go fight them <laughs> yeah. like, what the fuck you yes. i wasted a month and a half to figure out that this is like a pink oyster like you lied and plus i yeah. gave you like I mean, 25 dude, bucks like look so say because i've heard people say oh well if i got it from somebody i trust though trust nope. That doesn't matter. I used to just trust if people. all you you are literally <laughs> obligated to grow the fruit out and only sell that which you have cultivated. I it's think that, that easy. Be the spores should be your own. They should come from fruit you grew, and then any clone, any like plate culture you sell, should not come from the place you got it it should come from fruit you grew so for example That's before sad. ed here worked his magic and got i mean well we still have to see what they look like but um before there were uh <laughs> spores of up. iceberg there was only a clone culture of iceberg and so someone might go well what's the difference i'll just sell her clones i got it i paid for it i'll sell it don't sell her clone grow your own shit, sell your own clone. At that point, I mean, because no one can really just own these things, but at, at that point, you have put in the work, you have made it your own fruit, you're selling something you created, not something somebody else created. And it's it's important because I talked to somebody the other day about, uh, um, I said something like, well, do you even know? Oh, they were doing, uh, they said, man, I can't get any of my spore swaps to germinate. And I said, well, do you know that there are spores on them? Well, no. How would I check that? With a microscope. I don't have one. Okay, well, then you're shit out of luck. If you had one, you could check that out. And then if you didn't have spores, you could go back to the vendor and say, you just sold me sporeless spore swaps. And then, and then that vendor needs a lecture about why, if you're going to vend spore swabs, uh, you better own a fucking microscope. Yeah, that goes uh, my, back to another another Yeti story when that was... Uh, yeah, I, I was working with swabs that I thought I was doing something wrong, and it turns out there was no spores on the swabs. They were really, really dark blue swabs. Yeah. They were saturated, as people mm -hmm. say. By the way, you guys, spores don't saturate things. The correct word is adhesion or adhere. Right. Of I'm again. I'm in a little bit of rant today, you guys. Spore swabs that are saturated. That the, saturated is a term that refers to liquids. If you have a liquid on your spore swab and it that's has somehow right. become saturated, that's what those piss mommy poco like diapers do. They get saturated. Right. If I get a, a $15 spore swab and the term I use is saturated, that's not a good term. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're, they shouldn't be wet like... in the first place. No, God, they should no. have literally <laughs> never been wet. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. That okay. That's it. There's the word that triggers me. Saturated refers to something that was once wet. Yes. A spore swab should never be wet. Spores right. are not wet. If you're right. getting a spore swab so wet, that that means you're mashing it into the tissue that yes, is wet. Sir. A spore swab should never ever should have been wet. Remember, spores disperse in the air. They're meant right. to float, They'll not fall liquids. Right off. Yes. Yes, they should fall off and float in the air. They should never yeah. be saturated. I have had a few <laughs> varieties that it is very difficult to get them in between the gills because they are a little tough, and you will get a little of that bluing as God, a. As as a result of that but oh yeah always yeah always. It, it does happen but a light touch it's definitely all about the light touch 
But like you said, you'd, you'd really only notice that if you could look under a microscope. And I mean, I know microscopes are a bit out of the budget for a lot of people. But really, if you if you have a mature fruit and you are swabbing it, just literally touching it. I mean, think about like, you know, when you pick fruit off a tree, yeah. you know, if you're going to go like pick cherries, you don't need to like rub your hand up against the whole branch. and like <laughs> You just need to pick off the little cherry like the mm -hmm. spore. And you'll be amazed, a very light swab. Like I said, the first time I did translucent sw uh, spores, I was like, I just barely touched it. And there yeah. was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of spores. And I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, that's awesome. Like, and then I was like, from one fruit body, you can make 20 spores if you do it lightly, if it's a, you know, decent sized fruit. So when like Susie's doing 400 or whatever he said, like, that's a probably like maybe 20 fruits. Like on a good size monotubs, you could make a thousand swabs. Easy. Sorry, Nikki. It, it's like <laughs> but you, you, that's the thing too. That's what upsets me. If you can't grow a shoe box and get your own damn swabs and take a picture of the shitty, spo the yeah. shitty shoe box, like, look, this yeah. is where I got my swabs from. I'm, it's I'm gonna... a fucked up bacterial grow, but look, one of the fruits was good. And that's where I got my 20 swabs from. So check this out. You just made me think of something else, uh, a thing I don't think I've ever talked about. So when you're swabbing, right, You everybody who knows anything is trying to touch the, the back end of, of the swab. They're not trying to touch down here. Yeah. <laughs> right? So you're always a good technique. You're trying to stay back here, right? But yep. now check check this out. So you That's have, like you have touched back plate. here. <laughs> And if, if you're not, if you're like me before Ed gave me a, a, a talking to uh, about gloves, if you're not wearing gloves, I don't care how clean your hands are. If I'm touching this barehanded and I put my first swab in here, right? That's in there now. And then what do you do for the second one? And maybe even hopefully you're really smart and you, you, mm curve this out so it doesn't touch the the wall of the thing but what everyone does I, I would have to guess is as they're sliding it in they are rubbing the mm. the tip against some of that stick so i always flex it up and away from it i mean this is the level of yeah, thought exactly. process you have to have yes if you want to truly be sterile this is why my Same shit here. is clean as fuck. i that, dry everything i don't care how light a touch or heavy a touch i had sits in front of the flow hood those swabs are literally three to five millimeters away from my grill they sit there all freaking day or all night they're dry as a bone when they go into the packaging and i'm meticulous about how i put them in the in the packaging yep amen brother Just gotta think it through is that and what if you're like i use these like um, Ziploc baggies, so I can open these with my fingers and get a and hole And never there. touch the inside. Yeah, yep. never touch the inside, the and then I seal it back up, and I, I use a, a nipper, it's kind of like a wire cutter, and I mm -hmm. spray it with alcohol, and so the double length swabs, like, so I end up with a swab that's only half the size. Like, yeah, cause it what doesn't I'll do even, is they don't need to be long anyway. So yeah, so I cut off great. the dirty part, and also that dirty part. A lot of people, if they're going to do it the, the old way, mm -hmm. they can fit that whole thing in a 90-millimeter plate. Yeah. So they don't have to. So with a gloved hand, all they literally have to do is open that, never touch it. Their gloved hand, I'm going to do it bad here because for – and, like, slide it out. And literally yeah. with a gloved hand, you touch that, do your business, yep. and maybe put it back in. And you've right. never, ever touched the swab except for with your gloved hand. Right. That's simple things that, like, to us, it makes perfect sense. But if you're a beginner, you might not realize all that stuff. Right. And, like, the video you sent me, oh, my gosh, like I said, I was having, like, heart palpitations. The guy who, he was using non-sterile <laughs> Q-tips. And oh, then he cut off one of the Q-tips and put the other half back in the I box know. with the other Q-tips. Hey. Like, he's saving half a Q-tip. But... <laughs> You know what? Know. Some people, I, I it's a sport. The frugality is a sport, dude. It's I know, but it's a, it's a Q-tip. They oh, call dude, it cotton, but. Check this out. Your your idea of breaking the sticks off, I never thought about it like this, but my friend Overjoyed said, great idea, the long sticks break in the mail. Mm, that's another they, reason. They do. Because I, so, fi I fit them into um, like a standard greeting card. I got like 
stuff. I got like, oh, welcome to Thailand. Happy from Thailand. I put mm -hmm. them in here and two of these swabs. Yeah, I'll just grab. I can tape them right here. So I'll put a post-it note in the middle so that it ends up. It's like kind of a frugal way. And it's also a very inconspicuous way. That's like, right. what the hell is this inside a greeting card? Like, oh, yeah, send it on. Yep. Never a problem. This is the way you guys, by the way, this is the way people have been sending spores for like 50 years. Correct. Like way before the internet. <laughs> you know that old guy in Oregon who like, yeah, that like white beard probably knows Sunshine. Like yeah. this is the way Sunshine used to send spores in the mail. She didn't call them genetics. She called them spores. She probably even yeah. called them seeds. Who like knows? mushroom yeah. seeds. <laughs> yeah. but that's the old school way to do it. Yeah. All right, dude. All we've been, dude. We're almost at at the four oh, hour shit. mark. I, oh, I had I no idea. Forgot. We're just we're just <laughs> jazzing out, and you, you, of course, your day's just beginning. So yeah. Um, but anyway, it's been good. I think we covered a lot of stuff. We cracked some jokes. We talked about some venereal diseases. We talked about uh, uh, lady boys oh. in Bangkok. We talked about uh, oh, British people's proclivity for raw dog in it. We we covered the gamut tonight. <laughs> Man, how many people have I pissed off in like the last hour and a half? I They're gonna be small like, number of people though. It's okay. There's like six guys, fucking vendors, four swabs, couple British guys, some lady boys outside yeah. my door waiting to kick my ass. Mm -hmm. Women who like the taste of bitter cock. Yes, all those. <laughs> they will be mad at you. Yes. Okay, right. I know what my my Tinder profile. I know what is going on there later. There you go. You're set. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, well, thank you, Ed. We'll see you next week. Um, see with you guys. More, we'll learn about cancroid next week. Uh, <laughs> some of the lesser known venereal diseases. All right. Oh, God, don't get me started. All right, dude. All bye right, bye see you later. All right, guys. Uh, wow, that was a long one. Um, I am tired. I'm a little under the weather right now. I'm definitely going to go take a nap. And by nap, I mean sleep all night. Uh, thanks again. Uh, next week, we have... God, who do we have next week? Somebody who grows mushrooms. Um, God, why can I think... What is it? The 20... Oh, yeah. Oh, I have uh, round two of my uh, female cultivator podcast. Um, I have all sorts of really amazing female mycologists coming on. They're, they're going to kind of do what... We did with uh, the the first uh, female mycology podcast, and just kind of expose everybody to some female cultivators who are doing great work, and uh, get to hear a little bit more about their perspective of being a woman in a female dominated community. When I started this podcast, um, and I would go look at like the demographics of who was watching the the podcast, it would be like 0.2 percent women. <laughs> be almost exclusively men and I think that's almost up to eight or nine percent women now so it's really great to see uh, women growing because the reason we grow this medicine uh, women have all those things too so uh, this is an empowering thing this is important for women to be able to uh, feel like that they can they have every right to grow mushrooms too and in a space without harassment or anything like that. So we're going to hang out with a handful of women next week. And it's going to be a good time, guys. Uh, all right. I will talk to you next week. Uh, have fun growing mushrooms this week. See you next. <laughs>